If there's any way we could post um, on our website that the live stream is down, we've halted the meeting until we can get that back up. I think there's some confusion out there. Kelly, Erica just posted it. Wonderful. The new link or posted the information that it was halted? The information that it was halted. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Of course she did. She's awesome. President Griffin, I might encourage you when we do come back up to um, kind of start from the very beginning at that point. And yeah, sorry about that. We were. Okay. I understand that we're ready to start again. Okay, so um, what I had started to explain was what our process is, and, and just to be clear, uh, we did ask people to sign up in advance, and I believe that Mr. Shepard has the names of people, and he's going to be letting people on. And um, we do allocate for each item, we, we generally allocate 10 minutes, but if we need to uh, gather more information, we can vote to uh, expand that time frame. Um, Mr. Hanlon um, is keeping time. Ten minutes in three minute yes, 10 minutes in three minute blocks. And we also try to alternate people who are pro and con on a particular subject because we don't want all the time eaten up by one side. We try to have fairness in uh, listening to that. So uh, the other thing is you will note that there are no items from the floor uh, on, this, on this calendar since it is a workshop. Uh, we listen to the information that's presented uh, by staff and uh, we talk about it and then we open up questions for uh, the, the public to, to call in. Um, anything else, Kathy? Uh, so did the announcement that I made go out? Dr. Kaiser, they did not. Okay, so I guess I could do that again. Okay, well, we did vote, and I think the vote is still good. But yes, Kathy, please uh, repeat your announcements. Okay, um, so everyone is very aware and concerned about the upcoming election. Uh, Good County will be voting by mail. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that is focused on people having the correct information before they vote and then actually voting. So I have two signs out here. One is to actually vote. Your vote counts dramatically. And the other one is about where you can find, again, nonpartisan, every candidate had an opportunity to put their content in. Uh, on the facts before you vote, and that's voters' edge. The League of Women Voters has already conducted the candidate form for the Chico Unified School Board, and that is now originally, um, it was recorded, and it's now posted on the League's website. The next aspect is that the census was restructured to go back to the original timeline of October the 31st, um, Butte County is still below 60% response rate. Um, and so we are strongly urging you to do your census. You can do it by phone, you can do it on your computer. Um, you can, uh, you know, do it by paper. The reality is that every person in Butte County on April the 1st uh, contributes $10,000 over the 10 year period to our budget. Um, the last one is that on October the 8th at 6 p.m., again, a, uh, a, a live presentation 
the league will review the pros and cons of the ballot measures. And so if you have uh, questions about those, you can watch that and it will again be on the league website. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Um, and thank you. Okay, and Eileen? Yes. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties out there, folks. I, I did previously thank everyone who has sent in emails over the last few months and mentioned that I've read everything that got into my in-basket before 4.15 today and wanted to thank the interest from the parents, the community, and students um, in, in what's happening with our schooling and let you know that the input is so valuable because it lets us know if what we're contemplating with the advice and information that we get is going to meet the needs that are being expressed. And I know we can't meet everybody's needs, but the closer we can come to, um, to, to getting everyone's needs at least um, significantly met, um, the, the better I feel as a board member making these decisions and hopefully the community is going to understand if they only get part of what they need, it's, you know, it's, it's the best, the best, best we can do and we'll continue to make improvements. What we decide now and put it into place, it takes a while to iron the bugs out. Mm. So we've got more bugs, but um, we're, we're doing the very best. And thank you to our amazing staff for all that they're doing as well. OK, thank you, Eileen. Uh, so we will begin. and. Um, I believe I mentioned before, this is largely for the staff to provide uh, information. These issues that have come up having to do with COVID, um, with the online learning, with the potential for reopening school, for you know, all of these are, are very complex, multifaceted, and there's a lot of moving parts. So for people who are out there watching, I really hope that you listen carefully I know there's a lot of emotion behind what you know is going on out there, uh, but but please try to listen for the background uh, issues and challenges that are faced, and those are going to be discussed. Uh, so first of all, we have a consent calendar to go through, and um, I would need uh, to know if anybody would like to pull anything from that calendar. Linda, no. No, I do not. Okay, Tom, no. Okay, Kathy, no. No, actually, I'd like to move the consent calendar. Oh. Okay, motion by Kathy. Second. Second by Eileen. All right, we're going to take a, because uh, officially we didn't really, I guess we did have a, we'll take a roll call vote just to be safe. Uh, Javi? Aye. Lando? Lando, aye. Kaiser? Kaiser, aye. Griffin, aye. Robinson, I. Okay, that's unanimous, so our consent calendar passes. Uh, we will now move on to um, the educational services information, which is our October workshop. And our objective is to examine online learning to evaluate the program, including an emphasis on the social, emotional, and mental learning impacts. And is that Mr. Marchant? Yes, it is. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so every year we uh, sit down with the board and talk about what different workshops that we wanna maybe look at to go over for the school year. The first the one that we're gonna be going over tonight is the uh, online learning update. Our agenda for that is we're gonna give you our delivery timeline, our curriculum and instruction, our professional development, our social emotional learning support, and future considerations and next steps. So I just want to let you know, again, when we are putting this together, things you'll see in our timeline have continued to change along our way. So we're, again, and that's what you'll be seeing tonight as we go on. First, if we could look at the timeline that got us here. Again, on March 19th, the governor announces the closure of in-person instruction. So that's where we started all this. And then we had about 48 hours to put an online program together at that time. Our teachers did a really good job of uh, putting together a curriculum in such a short amount of time. But, and our community thought, again, was very 
thankful that our, of our teachers, but also that our community had sought more input for next year for us about this school year and how we were going to complete things. So as you can different see, the uh, school ended on June 4th. Then also we come down, we were planning at the time uh, for bringing in options for reopening schools at the time. And we at that time, the board had, uh, on July 15th voted to go to an AMPM instructional model. Then soon after, we were put in a different stage to where it only allowed us, which we call the purple stage now, to go to online learning completely. So then we turned our planning together to put a curriculum together and everything to get ready to open our schools with online learning. And that's what we're going over today. Some of the considerations we looked into um, when we developed our program was our LCAP goals that we always have to follow. So our five LCAP goals that we wanted to look over our local control accountability plan to make sure we were meeting the needs of that. Our major CARE Act's funding, that's federal funding that we got for COVID. We spent a million and a half, these are some of the big spending, we obviously had other little ones, but I'm just gonna go over some of the big ones. A million and a half dollars were spent for Oak Bridge teachers, that's our online school that we gave the option for parents to choose to just go to there instead of one of our, their traditional school. We spent $500,000 for curriculum, digital curriculum for for our elementaries and secondaries to be ready. We spent another $3 million in technology to make sure that we had the technology in place for all of our students and our teachers. And then we spent another $280,000 in professional development to make sure our teachers were ready to go at the start of the school year. We also looked into our community feedback from last spring, which said that again, that our teachers worked extremely hard, but they wanted a more consistent online learning model for their students. Again, we had Senate Bill 98, which we'll be going into later. Um, Mr. Karras will be kind of explaining what that was and what the things that we had to follow for the Senate bill. And our rapidly changing mandates and conditions. And we need a platform flexible in in-person and online instruction. So if we did able to go back, we had a flexible program. And again, our technology. At this time, I'm just gonna have Mr. Sullivan kind of go over what we did for our elementary curriculum. So just following up on what Mr. Marchant shared, uh, uh, some desire to have a little bit more of a set kind of daily schedule of things. Mm -hmm. Kind of what's up here now is kind of a sample of a typical day, day for elementary students. They roughly have about three hours of morning kind of Zoom interaction. And once again, that's not that they're sitting on the computer for three hours, but there's three hours of teacher-led activities, instruction, support happening during that time and they follow up with about an hour a day of asynchronous or kind of a homework or course, um, coursework expected to be done in a home setting that can be done anytime really around the family schedule mm -hmm. with those kinds of things. So all of the schools and all the teachers follow a schedule similar to this, slightly different starting and ending times, but it's roughly in the elementary world about a three hour asynchronous time, you know, like live in person kinds of opportunities, followed up with about an hour of asynchronous or kind of coursework to be completed at a future time. And teachers are also working a full day available for supports and kind of parent-teacher talks and all those kinds of things as well. So the next page with it, as Mr. Rashant shared also, we knew we had to buy a different curriculum. What we have currently was just not a really good fit for an online world. So we started talking with DLC and starting talking with a mix of other teachers to kind of get some feedback on what might be a good, better option for us to use. So we went out and we purchased Wonders, which is an ELA curriculum, and it's really, uh, we have Treasures currently. This is an upgraded version of Treasures, and it's just a much more online-friendly uh, version of things also. We've been using iReady Math as kind of a support program anyway, so a lot of teachers are familiar with it, so we went out and bought their math component with it as well. So we bought Ready Math to go along with it, and we bought some other uh, science. It's called Mystery Science. It's just a much more online-friendly science program that's kind of very standards-driven as well with a lot of videos and kind of independent work possibilities mm -hmm. with those things. Another big push, our junior high has been telling us for years they would love to have our kids matriculating over the junior high with better keyboarding and mm -hmm. computer skills. So we saw this as an opportunity to put some uh, asynchronous or kind of some of those homework-based um, time, practice time in place for that. So we bought keyboarding without tears. 
And we have studies weekly available also, which is a, a social studies curriculum also that lines up to it as well. Can Priscilla, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that ELA stands for English oh, Language. Oh, I'm sorry, English Language Arts. And, and our DLC is our district leadership. Sorry, and if I'm using acronyms, I... Yeah, I, thank I, you for that because, um, yeah, I know, we know. we know yep. a lot of things, but so, some of them are... Thank you for correcting people. Ms. <laughs> and really, we wanted to have a teacher check in with you. And I've been uh, lucky the last couple of weeks taking some time to actually just drop in Zoom conversations and watching classes mm -hmm. happen. And so I asked one of our teachers who's been doing a bang up job. And I actually dropped into Maudie's class a couple of days ago and kind of watched for about a half hour. So I asked Maudie Lopez if she would share for about five minutes here of kind of what she does, what does her day look like. But also, a big component is we know our kids are not getting kind of um, peer time. Mm -hmm. together. They're not connecting with their friends because they're in, they're all in their own place. So I wanted to ask Maddie to share a little bit of like, what are you actually doing so kids can have some time together with each other in this online world? So I think she is on there and she's ready to share. Maddie, do you want to introduce yourself and share? Hello, good evening. I, my name is Maris Lopez Maddie, and I am a fourth grade teacher at Rosedale Elementary. Um, a typical day in my classroom consists of um, a quick um, 15 minute check-in when they when they first log in in the morning. Um, and we go over our daily schedule and I just check in with the kids to see how they're doing. Then we uh, go on with um, English language arts, which I use the curriculum wonders. We then have reading groups. Um, and then we have a 30 minute or a 25 minute recess um, and following with math after recess. After math, that is the end of our asynchronous time. However, I allow the kids to stay on if they need additional support on their homework, which is the work that I assign during um, asynchronous time. Um, some ways that I keep my students socially connected to me is I have created um, five minute power chats every other week where I chat with the kids. Um, during this time, I just, we go over data or we talk, about if they have any questions, they can ask, and this is also a time where I'm able to know them and build the connection with them. Um, several of my kiddos are shy and they, they will turn off their cameras during instruction. So during these five minute power chats, it's just them and I, and it, it's a great way to build the connection. Um, I also tend to start Zooming or my Zoom meetings 15 minutes early to chat with my students. And this is also a great time. The kids love this time. They come on and they share their toys or they just socialize for the first 15 minutes of class. Um, I've also done 10 minute power chats with parents um, if, and, and students if they want to join for questions as well to build a connection with families. Um, some ways that I keep my students socially connected um, is by creating breakout rooms during recess. So during their 25 minute break, um, they are able to go into breakout rooms and they, they chat with each other, they play games. I've been able to join them and they're playing charades or drawing. Um, and this is during their break. Um, I do encourage them to move around and leave the screen. Um, however, they miss their friends. They still have that social time during their recess. Um, I also have created breakout rooms during math and ELA time. And I know many teachers are doing this where they are able to collaborate. Um, these groups were based on a student choice survey so that they feel comfortable sharing with their peers. So I created these groups based off of um, a survey that I share with the students. Um, they have also been able to write narratives with friends during our writing. Try one is narrative writing. So they've been able to, to write with their friends. And I know that other teachers are also doing that and it's, it's been great. Um, I know the students are loving it. Um, they are also able to create flip grids and um, these are just short little videos and they're able to comment on each other's videos and I know that the kids have really enjoyed those flip grids. Um, I try to make a weekly flip grid for them for fun. Um, some students also stay socially connected through a classroom chat that I created in Google Hangouts and this is a way where kids are able to stay socially uh, connected th during asynchronous time. So when they are not with me live on Zoom, it's a chat with my whole class and I send reminders um, or they just ask each other questions and if they need help with, with assignments, they, they're able to chat with each other through their Google Hangouts. Um, other ways are um, once a week, they, I provide interventions and those kiddos that aren't in interventions are able to play 
um, Prodigy, which is a standard-based math game, and they're able to play with their friends. And I know that a lot of the kiddos have been enjoying that as well. Um, and they've also uh, had on Fridays, we have Fun Fridays, which is just for the kiddos that have completed their work. Um, for the week during their asynchronous and classwork, they get a 30 minute free choice uh, every other Friday. And I've been, it's great time. The kiddos are playing, they play Prodigy, which is that math standard based game. I've been in there playing charades, jumping around. Um, I've encouraged videos. It's just a great time that happens every other Friday. And something that's in the works for me is study groups. Um, I know other teachers are doing study groups during asynchronous time. And I know that the kids have really enjoyed doing that as well. Those are just some ways that the kids have been socially um, connected with their teacher, myself, and themselves as friends. So thank you, Matt. I think there's a couple questions for you, Maudie, also. Thank you for sharing. OK, Kathy. Uh, Marisol. Um, I just wanted to get clarification. I think I understand. So your power chats, the five minute ones, this is with one individual student and their family or just with the student, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And that was so that I could stay connected with my students. Um, it's hard to get them to chat sometimes. They may be shy to turn on their cameras. So those five minute power chats, it's just myself and the student. And if the parent wants to join, they, they can. Um, they share their, they brought in their pets. It's just a great time to build connections with my students. I have one of those shy ones, so that's great. Thank you. Okay. Any yes, other? and it's great to get to hear them. It, it's, it's been one of my favorite things. It is during my lunch, but I, I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> we could also do that during asynchronous time. I just choose to do it during my, my lunch. Okay. Any other questions for Mari? Thank you, Maudie, very much for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So real, that's really what elementary is centered around. Like I said, if you ever get a chance, if you ask any of your elementary principals, they can share a Zoom link with you if you'd like to drop in and watch a class and session for a while, too. Really, is a, it's, it's incredible, honestly, when I've watched. I've been dropping in almost daily the last couple weeks here. And every time I drop in, I'm, I'm pretty wowed by what's happening with them. I think Liz and I are more than dropping <laughs> in. We are drowning in it. <laughs> OK, I'd just like to remind the board of the uh, secondary synchronous and asynchronous timeline and the schedule that we have built. What I really want to highlight here is that asynchronous time that's going to be ongoing in the, in the schedules that we're considering. Because that asynchronous time, you're going to see some data soon that is going to support our encouragement of using that time. As we all know, Edgenuity in itself has been a challenge in some ways. And I'm going to have a teacher, Mark Kessler, come on and talk about that in a second. But one thing we can do, definitely do in the future, is make sure we use that asynchronous time um, in, in other ways. So I would like to turn this over to Mark Kessler. He is a science teacher at Chico High School. We, I'll use this word, recruited him from a neighboring district a couple years ago, and he's fantastic. Mark? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity, and thank you, board members, for your service to our community. Um, I was asked to give a candid assessment of successes, challenges, and hurdles with online learning. Um, and uh, when someone says give candid, uh, you know, it's fraught with disaster. So I'm going to do my best here to be uh, both honest and, and um, constructive. I also made an effort to survey other teachers. When um, John asked me to do this, I, I talked to other teachers and uh, make sure that I'm not just representing myself, but I'm representing some others. Of course, I don't represent all teachers, and uh, that's not possible. So some may uh, have different perspectives than I do. I also was thinking about this because when we started, I was asked to do this. Um, we were all online, and there was no talk yet about going back to in-person. And I thought about it a lot, and I talked with some teachers, and we realized that regardless of whether we go back in person, uh, due to our circumstances, we're still in an online learning environment because we can't uh, hand out papers, we can't hand out textbooks. It's going to be very difficult to do labs and science with eyes touching microscopes and hands touching test tubes. We can't do our usual group um, discussions. So in many ways, even though we're going in person, we're still going to have students on Chromebooks. 
uh, separated from each other. It will be better, but it is still online learning. So how we approach on online learning will be the measure of success for the school year. Um, so I'll share some things that I learned this year about online learning. I've learned that it can be effective under the right circumstances. So more to follow on that. I've learned that students and teachers are more adaptable and more resilient than we think. I've learned that all of the systematic, systemic problems in education and society are magnified in an online learning environment. For example, we know that lack of support at home can be a problem with in-person teaching. It, with online learning, lack of support at home is nearly catastrophic. And these things are magnified. So these are not new problems. They're not gonna go away either when we come back, but they are more difficult with online learning. Um, and that goes with equity and, and, and all those issues. Um, I've learned that despite all our technological advances, it is still difficult to contact parents. And that in the end, the only thing that really works is a good old fashioned phone call. Um, I've learned that teachers, for teachers, online learning turns a regular school day and school week into a 24 seven job. Teachers receive dozens of emails a day and concerning issues that need to be resolved immediately. So at Saturday morning at 9 a.m., if you get an email and you can't respond to that student, they can't move forward in their learning. And so it really becomes a situation where I, I'm Zooming with students six o'clock in the evening, I'm answering emails all weekend, and most teachers are as well. It's, it's so, it, there's a, a greater load on the teacher with online learning. Um, this next one, I don't think this is very new to you, um, and this is the candid part. Uh, so I, I have learned that, that a scripted pre-recorded program like Ingenuity is one of the least effective ways to do online learning. It, it delivers this large quantity of low depth of knowledge information. Uh, unlike a teacher, these programs are insensitive to students' academic pace and their emotional needs. You know, we, we had some emotional events here at Chico High and uh, the scripted programs were unable to respond to that and teachers would have been. Um, it really it further isolates students because it, it makes their teachers and uh, fellow classmates irrelevant. And in fact, I had students sometimes say, uh, can I leave now? Because I, I, I don't, they basically didn't need us when we were in an ingenuity situation. It makes teachers, and, and this word was uh, used a fair amount by other teachers, so uh, despondent by eliminating their main purpose for teaching. And one of the biggest issues is it really doesn't assess well. And the, one of the problems is all the answers on ingenuity are available online. And uh, I don't mind saying this publicly because I think the, the students already know. And that those, those answers have been, haven't, the questions haven't changed in four years uh, at least. And they're readily available. And the students taught me how to find them. And I was able to get a, an A on every quiz uh, using that method. So it's not giving us accurate assessments. And so one of the frightening things for a teacher this far into the year is we really don't know what our students have learned. And because we can't really trust the assessments in ingenuity. Um, a couple of quotes from teachers, my students are responding. They learn from more from me in 20 minutes than four hours on ingenuity. Um, one I got from a student is, Mr. Kessler, I'm getting an A, but I'm not learning anything. So what I learned is that students actually care about learning, not just grades. They actually care about their learning. And that's, and maybe they didn't know it, but now they do, they know the difference. And that's, that's something we gained from this experience. Um, and they are so eager and so excited uh, to get instruction from their teachers again, that the buy-in is amazing. Um, now I've learned one of the main challenges for teachers with online learning is finding a way to assess student learning. And I really appreciate uh, Board President Griffin's comments in the ER yesterday about the importance of assessing student progress this year because it's a huge issue. Um, and it is possible to create secure assessments, but teachers need training on how to use tools like Google Forms with a locked browser on a district Chromebook. I recently helped a teacher 
And it took about two hours to train them and they were already very proficient in tech tools. So this is something that needs to be addressed. We need to have uh, accurate and secure assessments in order to get data that we can use to drive instruction. Um, I have also, I've learned that um, with online learning, it's better to teach less and teach it well than try to cover all the standards. I've learned that professional learning communities are an essential part of the educational success at Chiku Unified and that dropping PLC, PLCs from the schedule this year, um, when we have so much to learn and discuss, made a difficult situation even harder. Now, I always like to close with a solution because uh, in a past life, I was a board member and uh, a school board member. And I always appreciated when the public included some solution with their list of issues. Um, and I just feel like in order to have good quality instruction, it's important to invest the time and training necessary to allow teachers to develop the necessary skills. If we wanna be successful this year, uh, my recommendation is that regardless of whether we choose the AMPM model or the AB schedule, is that we make one day a week an advisory slash teacher collaboration day so that we can have time for professional development led by district teachers and time for extended PLCs each week to work on curriculum and assessments. My thought is, and I, and I'm, I didn't invent this, Durham a Unified has this system um, and uh, I, I, taught, I conferred with a the teacher there and they explained how it works. But in, in other words, each week would have two days of instruction and one day of morning advisory class. The advisory class would address the social emotional needs of students, give academic support and give us an opportunity to reinforce COVID protocols if necessary. The afternoon or the rest of the morning would be devoted to weekly professional development and uh, PLCs, office hours and student support. It would give students one day a week to address academic and emotional needs. It would give teachers time to learn online tools, collaborate on curriculum and assessments in their PLCs. It would give teachers time to make phone calls to parents and students. It would give teachers time to schedule office hours and one-on-one -on -one Zoom or in-person support. And I also think it would just on the side would be easier for working parents because their students would be going to school the same day, two days every week instead of alternating. And if they're gonna try to figure out drop off and pick up, it just seems to me as a parent, I would want the same days every week instead of a, a mix. Um, in general, your teachers are willing, your students are eager and all that's necessary is some planning time for teachers, uh, commitment to continuous professional development and online learning and an emphasis on excellence. Okay, Mark, thank you. And as I, I just wanna make sure the that uh, I do appreciate Mark's candid um, responses. We are always, it's always requested of us to be transparent and clear and take as much feedback as we can. So thank you, Mark. Mark has been also one of the teachers that's been working with us all summer and all the different Monday, and all the different Monday meetings. So just to clarify a couple of expectations we had over, this, over the uh, course of this online adventure, we do have classes that are not using Edgenuity and I've got some listed here. I really wanna send a shout out though to our, to our special ed teachers, their aides, and Diane Olson's team. Um, of all the groups, they may have had the most difficult um, position, they were in the most difficult position because they had to not only take courses they weren't familiar with, but then accommodate, modify, and customize those courses for individual students within individual courses. So it wasn't just modifying a course is modifying specific student um, pathways. And they were able to do that uh, to satisfy most of our parents. So I just wanna send a shout out to that group. We did add a couple of technology support teachers to be sure that our staff had people sitting in their, shoot, or in their seats and looking at things through their lens to support them from a technological perspective. Oh, thank you, John. But um, before um, we move on to anything else, I would just like to ask, um, Mr. Kessler, is there a possibility you could stick around for the rest of this meeting? Certainly. Um, I'd be glad to. We, we are going to be discussing them, some, some additional topics, and I'm not sure if, if Mari can do the same too, but um, it would really be helpful um, to, to get some feedback from, from both of you. 
So I, I know it's busy. I know you've got a busy schedule tomorrow, and I, I hate to ask you that, but um, it would really help us, I think, um, if we could go to you for some further questions, if they arise. Um, I'm sorry, John, so I didn't no, mean to great. interrupt. That's great. I'm, I hope they can stick around. So just our, our last slide here for secondary, well, now it's not secondary anymore, it's K-12. Our Oak Ridge Academy has expanded. I just want to show you the enrollment um, as of September 24th was up to 528 students. We wow. did ask uh, Rhonda Odlum, the administrator in charge of Oak Ridge, to add a slide deck here, specifically describing the K-5 curriculum that we will be bringing to the board in two weeks for adoption. So it is linked to this presentation. We're not gonna go through it right now because we will be going through it later, but I wanted mm -hmm. to make sure people had access to that. We did add some staff. Seven, we currently have 17 general ed teachers, two special education teachers, and we added a registrar. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Karras. Okay, so you can see the board can see you right now. Is the last slide up? Sorry about that. So the people in this room can't see right now what's cut off the, t the top of the titles. This is elementary all day attendance. And this is the rate for this year and I'm gonna ask for the purpose of our meeting if we can move the, uh, the panel over. There we go, thanks. So Jay referenced SB 98 earlier, and we, we've talked about that over the course of the past few board meetings, but, but, but just to clarify how attendance is taken differently this year as opposed to previous years um, per SB 98, Students are marked as engaged or not engaged each day. They are marked engaged, which would correspond to present, uh, if they attend any part of their classroom Zoom meeting or a complete work at home. Okay, so the way it works is teachers take attendance on their Zooms as normal. The next day, attendance clerks go in and check their, their online work via uh, reporting out of one of our systems. Okay, so th then if the student does show that they've, do, uh, sorry, completed work that previous day, the attendance clerk then changed it to engaged, okay? So uh, because it's so different, uh, it would be not, uh, not, not advisable to look at this year's data compared to past year's data. What we're really looking at here is uh, the equity question and who, which student groups are falling behind the all students number and which students are not. Um, you'll notice that the student groups are the exact same student groups that you find on the California State Dashboard with one exception, and this exception is for uh, both elementary and the secondary slide you're gonna see in a second, and that is uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged is not there. Uh, we had a glitch in our nutrition services data system that's been, we just got cleared up this afternoon, not in time to update the slides. But what we do see is uh, the homeless students uh, not attending. Um, then we see really see across the board um, uh, kind of a smattering of, of above and below uh, the all students number. The all students number of 95.5 attendance rate, 95.5% attendance rate is right around where our attendance rate is normally as a district. Okay, th this is the secondary slide. Uh, secondary again, under a normal year, uh, with a, given that attendance is taken differently, runs about 95.5%, okay? we are looking at 88%. So that means by period, the attendance rate is 88% across the board since the beginning of the school year. So that's a, a significant concern for us. On this slide, also with the secondary, we see more of a discrepancy between the English learners, foster, foster youth, and students with disabilities, and then again, homeless. From, down from the 88% for all students. So we do see more of a discrepancy here for our students in high need student groups. 
Any questions on the attendance slides before we move on? One question. Mm -hmm. Do we have the uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged numbers now, even if they're not on the slide? I haven't run them yet, but that's next on the list. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, what you can't see cut off at the top is, this is uh, Zoom meeting average minutes for our certificated staff. We, as a Ed Services team, were particularly interested in how teachers were uh, using their asynchronous time in the afternoon. Uh, so the classroom teacher data on the left-hand side only counts for ace is only counting asynchronous time. So keep that in mind. That's not their class periods, but that is the average minutes uh, per teacher per day that is spent on Zoom. The numbers are are low, definitely. But I also want to uh, go back to something that Mark Kessler just said: is that a lot of teachers are manning their their computer answering emails making phone calls so don't want to present uh, this as this is all the only way teachers can reach students during asynchronous time but it is the only data point that we have access to and it would give us an idea of like what kind of like small group instruction might be going on in the afternoon that would necessitate a zoom meeting over a phone call or, or an email also note on the on both sides of this slide is that our staff is not required to use Zoom. We do have staff members that favor Google Meet, and that data is not included here. So on the right hand side, the certificated support staff that would be Title I teachers, counselors, um, psychologists, etc. So certificated non classroom teaching staff. On the sites, you can see, and this is all day long because they don't have periods of kids coming in in the morning like a classroom teacher. So this is all day long. So we see overall the numbers are significantly higher, um, with the exception of the psychologist and the and the district wide staff group. The district wide staff group includes like uh, fine arts specialists, PE specialists, um, and music specialists that are itinerant and travel around from school to school. Actually, questions on that last slide before we move on. Well, a couple of questions, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Um, do the one? Do we know why the the psychologist numbers are are so small? Are they meeting with people via phone calls, or I'm not sure, and I'll defer to any Thanks. other Ed Services team members. If, sure. if they're working on IEPs, they could be meeting in person also, and that was one of the provisions. Okay. They, they're working to get IEPs put together. They could be meeting with students to be assessed or some of those kinds of things as well. Okay. Um, and do we know whether any of the uh, district-wide itinerants are doing things like posting recorded, pre-recorded videos instead? I, I know a lot of the elementary folks are doing things, especially the PE folks have been doing those kinds of things because they've tried to make it accessible for any time of the day where families could just almost like a, uh, I'm, I'm part of a fitness club now and I've got lessons posted and I can zoom in and watch those or I can watch the recordings of it also. So I could do a PE activity at eight o'clock in the evening if they wanted. And that makes a lot of sense. I just want some context for some of these mm -hmm. lower numbers because I know our teachers are still working all the time. Thank you. Yes, please don't uh, take those numbers as, you know, like I said earlier, all that teachers do because we know they're working like 24 seven in a lot of cases, like Mr. Kessler mentioned earlier. So I think the next slide here is just really geared for when we flipped and knew we were coming back in an online mode, kind of some things we did professional development wise to get ready for it. So throughout the summer, kind of leading up to it though, we've been meeting with a group of anywhere from 75 teachers every Monday for an hour or two, just kind of getting feedback about things as they were kind of unfolding with it. And we're still continuing to meet with that group this week even, and we'll continue meeting with them. I think the last week or two, it's been down to about 35 or so, um, but incredibly helpful with, with just a lot of input and helping with decisions and giving us a lot of their thoughts about what we should be doing as we got close to making a decision between online or AMPM with some of those kinds of things also. So Ted, were those uh, 
the DLC people or those an expanded group? It was expanded. It was DLC plus. I mean, it was kind of opened up to a wide range of folks from different levels, different courses, different um, RSP, non-RSP, whoever. It was just a pretty open group that was meeting. It was certainly with DLC encouragement to join us also. Okay, because I know the DLC is a group that it's, the, how are those people designated? How do, how do they get to be on that, on, that, on that group? So elementary has one teacher that we fund to be released a day a week to be part of that teacher leadership group. In elementary, mm -hmm. we meet two or three times a week, or excuse me, a month on Fridays typically. Um, secondary has a slightly different version of it, and I'll let Mr. Shepard talk a little bit about that for a moment. Sure, you can see you can see on the slide that secondary is broken into English language arts, math, and then science subcommittees. And then uh, once a month, we get together as an all secondary group, and then once a month we get together as an all DLC, so that you have elementary and secondary together. And, and one of the reasons the num I believe the numbers dropped a little bit from the summer to the end of the school year is that we're also still meeting, now we're meeting with DLC with these subgroups and with the elementary group, whereas, um, and also holding the Monday meetings. So people, they, they weren't, if you were a DLC member, you weren't attending both the Monday meeting and the subgroup meeting. Okay, and, but the, the DLC, they are chosen by the principals, by other teachers, how do they, how do they, how does I, that work? I think principal input is big, but it's also kind of like, they wanna make sure they take a, a respected staff member, and I'm using mm -hmm. that term loosely. They wanna have somebody that, that when they come back and report out or are doing the work, that when they come back and talk to the staff, that they're gonna have some respect from the staff also, and are well thought of on that campus. Okay, so that it kind of, that goes into it. But the, but the other people who participated in this were, were not of that, they were just self-selected. They were people who were interested and wanted to contribute. Correct, I think initially we just put out a note to, princi or to the principals and said, if you ask if you have five, six, seven teachers that might wanna start joining us, and it was just kind of an open via that mechanism first, and we had several people just asked to join, and it was kind of like anybody that's interested is welcome to come and join in the conversation. Okay, thank you. So as we flipped in, then we uh, organized three professional development days geared around kind of getting ready for online instruction. We took August 5th, 6th, and the 11th, and we paid teachers their daily rate to come back on those days, and just kind of a mix of trainings, everything from curriculum-specific kinds of things to online strategies. How do you operate Zoom? How do you do things in Google Classroom? And kind of tried to take a lot of feedback again from DLC to say, what do teachers need to know so that they can walk in and be um, feel like they, they're off to a good start with things that are gonna be happening in an online world with it. We took the August 12th day, which was our all, all staff development. That's a kind of the typical staff development day we have anyway. We certainly use that for that same follow-up purpose as well, getting ready for online with those things. Uh, going forward, there's been a mix of kind of weekly sessions, kind of one or two hour options that are put out there and we're paying teachers to come and participate with those. I think they're kind of generated by DLC once again. They go back to their site, they ask what are some things people are wanting more of. We come back and I, we kind of try to find some people that can facilitate those sessions and we put them out there and if people show up, we've been compensating them to come and join those. And, and there's a lot of interest also with those sessions. We are continuing as, it's, as we mentioned before, the Monday meetings are continuing. I think we've been appreciating the feedback we're getting from it, and it's definitely been very helpful with as we look at a whole range of different things to be considering right now with it as well. Uh, as Mr. Shepard shared, DLC is back and operating. We've been meeting weekly in elementary right now, which is a little bit more than we would meet typically, but there's so many decisions for us to be making and talking about, everything from modifying our report card to modifying assessments to modifying writing rubrics. So just going back and forth and getting a lot of feedback about, is this the right time to do that? Should we be paring this down? Should we be changing the, the kind of indicators on the report card? And they've really been the driving force in elementary with making those decisions right now. Okay, and lastly, I just wanna talk about the district-wide staff development days that we have. We usually have four every year, and the first one this year was really focused on getting us started, getting us ready to go. And at the time, we had planned to bring in a panel of uh, repre representatives from our community who represented some targeted student populations. Our BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color population, our Students with Disability population, our um, English learner population, and our foster and homeless youth population. And so we have uh, rescheduled that panel to join us on October 13th. And it's, it's, a, it's perfect timing for this conversation, even though folks may really be focused on um, a schedule change, possibly, we think we can't lose sight of learning loss. So the focus of the conversation is going to be laser-like 
on learning loss for those targeted student populations. As you can see from the data, it's timely. We need to have that conversation. So that's where we are with uh, professional development. So Mr. Shepard, before we move on, I want to make sure that we understand the, the secondary uh, professional development on August 5th, 6th, and 11th, and then again on the 12th was about getting them ready for ingenuity and the ones that they had to do develop classes that were not in ingenuity that we had the secondary teachers trained under those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. great, and thank you. And then the, w earlier in the slide, that's where that $280,000 of professional development money goes. Um, again, uh, we are able to use CARE Act dollars to get our teachers trained in those days, so we were very fortunate to have those dollars for that. As Mr. Kessler said, we, there's never enough professional development. We need to do them as much as we can. So we're going to jump into the next bucket. And we'll start with Tim. Sorry about that. Um, I mentioned SB 98 uh, earlier um, in the context of student attendance. SB 98 also um, calls for monitoring of student engagement and making contact with parents uh, and families of students that are not showing up to school. Um, so, and um, amongst other things, but um, I will be showing data on uh, targeted case manager and counselor outreach, which are prim our primary ways of reaching out to families um, regarding social emotional needs. Um, this year we'll, we are also implementing Kelvin district wide and we haven't done that yet this year due to, um, due to overload of new systems for our staff, essentially. Uh, we will be doing a soft rollout in the very near future. Teachers will have very little to do with that. They will be trained that we are gonna be giving the survey and that's about it right now because we don't wanna overload anybody at this point, but we do want to start collecting that social emotional data, more uh, robust social emotional data, which that will allow us to do. Another big support we've had in place has been Care Solace, which for those listening that don't know, we have a contract. It's a company that is able to match up um, social emotional kind of health providers with families or with students or with staff even depending on their um, insurance carrier or not insurance carrier or whatnot. And we've had a great um, success with them. They matched up a lot of folks to help make sure they're getting the supports that they need with those things. Uh, we have TCMs or targeted case managers, if you think of social workers at each site, and they are reaching out and touching bases in a whole range of ways with families about what's going on in their family dynamics right now, what supports do they need. And last one, we have a foster homeless liaison in place this year and he has been doing a great job kind of working with our foster homeless populations, and I think Mr. Kanji is on here with us now and wants to check in for a moment and share a little bit of what he's been doing and really kind of gearing around some of those numbers you saw Mr. Karras sharing before. So Ritesh, are you on here? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, yeah, I was just, you know, thank you for allowing me the time to come in here and, and share a little bit of what I've been doing with, with some of our foster and homeless kids. Um, and students. Um, so really, um, one of the things that I've been afforded is a chance to wear multiple hats um, with this position. Um, and one of those hats that I've been wearing recently is um, kind of being in charge of the, the hotspot and Comcast vouchers for students who are having difficulty logging onto their internet to, to stay in touch with um, their distance learning. Um, so one of the things that we've been able to do is offer um, and provide hotspots or Comcast vouchers for over 250 students. Now. And then, um, I'm hoping Tanya. Ritesh, are you still there? Sorry, I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> I don't think that was from me. I'm not sure what that sound was. I apologize for that if it was on my end. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, we were able to provide um, hotspots or Comcast vouchers for over 250 students, um, you know, to keep them connected to school. Um, another part of what I've been doing is um, helping facilitate registration and attendance into our into our um, homeless foster and at risk supervision program. And we were able to enroll and have 
of over 42 students, um, homeless and currently designated homeless and foster students who are registered and regularly attending. Um, and they're able to keep up with their schoolwork, uh, do their distance learning homework, and um, even make up some, some missed or late assignments, um, which has been some great, uh, great feedback that we've heard from, from some of those advisors and those teams. Um, another thing I've been able to do is regularly attend CFT meetings, and CFT stands for Child and Family Team um, Meetings with uh, Child Services. Uh, children's services, um, and that's been a great opportunity to work with teams and families and students to to help them develop plans um, for them to be more successful. Um, and some of the things that I've been able to help out with them is um, various things from transcript grade issues, connecting families and students to school counselors, referring students to PBIS or SBIT programs at schools. Um, referring them and setting them up with tutoring services through school ties, um, answering IEP process and program questions, um, and even getting students enrolled into school who, who have um, you know, not been able to, to get to a site to enroll. Um, we've been able to enroll students as well who have kind of been disconnected, and which, is, which is great. Um, another thing I've been able to do is reach out to the community. Um, I think collaborating with community members is a is a huge thing um, that's going to benefit our, our community and our students. Um, so some of those community partners, such as Boys and Girls Club, um, Hand Up Supportive Housing, Chico Housing Action Team, and Torres Shelter, um, they've been a huge boost to our community um, and just helping families throughout and, you know, just being able to collaborate with them and and create that um, create that relationship to to further solidify the success of our students. Um, I currently have 32 families and students on a weekly schedule of check-ins, um, and that list is ever growing um, as they as they come across my my radar. Um, and we we discuss various things such as. Um, their housing, their home life, their school life, their their social emotional well being, um, and then I'm able to to refer them to to the people that can that can help support them if if I'm not able to answer their questions immediately. Um, some of the challenges that I've had is meeting all the needs of all of our students. Um, you know, it's just a a huge population, and you know, just making sure I I address everyone um, and all their needs. And another challenge um, was initially to, to build relationships with families just requiring that time. Um, and that challenge quickly became a success once I was able to build those relationships and you know, building that trust with the families. And you know, it's just been a beautiful thing. Thanks, Ritesh. Are there any questions for Ritesh yeah. while he's here? Now, I just want to mention that I probably am the happiest person in the room right now because of our um, hiring Mr. Kanji <laughs> since I've been trying to have that happen for probably the last 12 years, um, understanding the importance of having someone who is focusing entirely, especially on foster youth, because they just slip through the cracks. They move around so much, and it is just so difficult. Um, there's too many moving pieces in their lives with social workers changing and schools changing and homes changing. And I am just so glad that we have you now, Mr. Kanji. I've only heard wonderful things about you. So thank you for being here, and thanks for finally hiring Mr. Kanji. I think it's fantastic. I think we've all thank swallowed you so much. the Kool-Aid, so thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a great addition. I just wanted to um, let in, earlier that Mr. Karras showed some of the attendance rates for our foster and our homeless, but they have gone up, especially having those 42 attending all the time, and he's done a great job of getting them there, and the success of their schoolwork has gone up amazingly from their teachers, so that's been another great positive. So those numbers will only continue to go up with him working with them. So just a few more things on this slide. We mentioned the asynchronous time before. That's going to be a major uh, focal point for us moving forward, regardless of what schedule we're in, because there is some time there that can be utilized um, better than it has been in the past for all of us. And we know that the synchronous academic time has been a major focus since the spring. But now that we have a better idea of what we can do during that asynchronous time, as we heard from Maddie, uh, we can use that. 
So there are some secondary ASB activities happening right now. We've got schools doing drive-through um, breakfasts and socially distanced in their cars, and so there are some things happening. We have um, virtual groups getting together, uh, not just your typical CSF and you know the, the ones that have been happening in the past, but but new ones as well. So we're excited about that. Obviously, that opportunity will grow if we're back in person in any way. There be there be some stronger connections made. And then lastly, I just want to remind the board of the shift from only um, high school wellness counselors last year to having that opportunity for our middle school uh, students as well. So we are excited about the work that they're doing. Okay, back over to Mr. Karras. Yeah, so this slide displays uh, counseling contacts uh, for the 2021 school year. Uh, so again, the, the title's cut off for those, those of you in the room, but this is counseling contacts, and this includes contacts from counselors and counseling assistants, okay, K-12. Uh, this is different than data. It's a different look at this data than I've shown the board in the past, so I want to take a moment to explain. This is displaying the rate that students are contacted. And in the past, we've, we've shown you total numbers of contacts. But what I wanted to do is call out, um, see, OK, are certain student groups getting contacted more often than others, as we would expect? OK? And so as we would expect, you know, per our conversation uh, with Ritesh just now, um, we are seeing our foster youth and homeless youth being contacted at a higher rate by our counselors. Uh, we see our English learners being contacted at, at a much higher rate. Uh, and then students with disabilities, uh, one thing to point out with, with that number, which is right around the all students number of 0.25 contacts per student, is special education students per their IEP have a, have a, a support team built in with that IEP that are also making contacts. Um, so other folks are checking in w with them. This is our tar targeted case manager contacts. Um, you can see the overall number for all students is 0.12 contacts per student. Um, and that's lower than the 0.25 we saw for counselors. And the reason for that is likely because we have fewer of them. We have much, a much larger uh, counseling team than we do with our targeted case manager, so more outreach is happening. But we do see the same trends with the high need student groups being contacted at a, at a higher rate. Quick question, just I wanna make sure I'm understanding the data mm -hmm. correctly. Is this over the course of the year so far? Yes. So what you're saying is roughly one out of every eight kids has been contacted by a TCM so far? Correct. Thank you. Any further questions about these? So we've tried to make sure we put some emphasis on social emotional supports also. So in the elementary world, we certainly are using our counselors and elementary counseling assistants, and they are reaching out still, where we're in this online world. They are continuing to deliver the typical curriculum that we have in, the, in an online format or version of it also with those kinds of things. Um, all the schools have wellness teams, so if you think of kind of a cluster of staff that gather together on a pretty consistent, if not weekly basis, and kind of talk about students that they are having concerns about, maybe missing school, maybe having some ups and downs, the wellness team is the group at that site that has that conversation and talks about putting a plan in place to help make contact, get, get in touch with, put, help get that student back on track in a way that's going to help them be successful. Uh, Certainly individual and group counseling has been happening. Uh, TCMs in particular and counselors are doing things with virtual kinds of uh, sessions as, as possible as well. Uh, let's see. Um, each school is trying in process of developing kind of a wellness page on their website as well to kind of make people aware of where they can access some of these things. And we actually have a group from Sierra View here to share for a few minutes kind of what they've been doing to kind of help parents as well, kind of a support group to make sure parents have uh, avenues to kind of check in and be connected as well. So I think um, Kim Rogers, Jackie, and G are here from Sierra View. 
Hi, I'm Kim Rogers, the principal of Sierra View, and I brought with me two members of our wellness uh, team, my targeted case manager, and my counselor. They'll introduce themselves here in just a little bit, but we're here to share with you what we're doing to support the social and emotional needs of our parents and our students, um, especially during these challenging times. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to my, my targeted case manager and counselor. And if you guys ask us, we'll just click through the um, slides that you have when you ask us to. Perfect, thank you, Kim. Um, so again, I'm Jackie Russo, I'm a school counselor at Sierra View. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. So my role as a school counselor is, of course, I do the counseling and then I do the fourth and fifth grade social emotional as well as running friendship group. We also have Debbie Herrick, who is, does our pop and pal programs. So pop is the power of play, which is one to one children driven play. Pals works with two students and is child driven again. And then Shayla Lewis, she does our social emotional for kindergarten to third grade and as well as friendship groups. So next slide. Good evening, everyone. I am G. Tao Lor, and I am the targeted case manager over at Sierra View Elementary School. And my role here is to gather resources and provide support to students and their parents. In addition to that, I am also bilingual, and I also act as interpreter to meetings, IEPs, and what to, you know what when I need it. Um, in addition to our team, we also have Sarah Pardini, and her job is the uh, student teacher support and the district liaison. She oversees the school-based intervention team providing support to our parents, teachers, and students. Next slide, please. So this is our wellness team. We meet weekly and also as needed when situation or crisis arise. Our team responds to our family immediate needs, such as providing resources, counseling, home visit, checking in with students and teachers, making attendance phone calls, and et cetera. Our wellness team works together to best provide support to our students and families, and of course, parents. So this is our counseling um, webs our, um, our website page. And we try to, this was given to teachers to show um, during back to school night for parents. So we try to be as parent friendly as possible with our step to step guide. Um, and then on the corner, you'll see our Sierra Calming Corner website link. If we could click on that, if possible. So this is our wellness team resource center webpage. Um, we have a student check-in, um, student resources, lessons and videos. And then if we could go to the parent resources tab on the top, yes. Um, so this shows uh, different mindfulness activities. Um, there's um, little quick link tabs to help with tips and then Going further down, we have a form where if students or parents are struggling with creating a schedule online, they can fill that out. Um, it's yeah, right there. It's the on family schedule. And then the tab next to it, we have COVID-19 that talks about um, the disease itself, as well as different preventions, um, how to help keep their family safe. And then we have again, our contact information. And so we can go back to the next. And over at Sierra View, we have a Sierra View Eagle parent support group. And our goal is to provide a safe space for parents to share their concerns, support each other and receive resources. Um, our wellness, wellness team will provide a forum for our parents. However, parents will eventually facilitate these meetings once we get it going. Um, our team will be available to answer any question as needed. We are going to have, we are going to have our first parent support meeting next Thursday, October 15th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And the topic will be meet and greet other parents at Sierra View. We have two scheduled in the coming month of November and December. Next slide, please. As you can see on this slide, um, these are the results that we have received from the parent survey that was sent out a couple of weeks ago. These meeting topics are parents driven and we're going to start with three topics that parents have the most interest in. Supporting online school curriculum will be second. 
um, in November and the Nurture Heart approach will be coming up in December. As of right now, and based on these surveys, our goal is to have the parent support group once a month. And I want to reassure everyone that we will keep it going after the new year, 2021, and update parents on Aries communication and on our Searview um, school website about upcoming dates and topics. So another thing that we're doing is lunch punch and fun with the wellness team. This is our tier one response um, to the distance learning. So what that means is all students are welcome to attend our lunch punch and fun with wellness team if it's in their grade level. So our goal is for students to have a safe space to interact with their friends and classmates. Students are able to build relationships with each other and the wellness team. Lunch punch is provided to second to fifth graders and fun with the wellness team is provided to kindergarten first. Meetings are 25 minutes once a week. So with this, um, we've had parents, you know, call in saying that their students are missing that social piece. And so this is our way to provide that for students to have that interaction as well as build um, additional um, relationships with staff members like our wellness team. Uh, next slide. So our additional support. So as mentioned before, all of the schools um, are doing the social emotional lessons, our wellness teams for kindergarten to fifth grade. We are also doing a storybook reading for all the grade levels with uh, different lessons. Again, our pop and pals check-in counseling, social connection groups, which is our friendship groups. Uh, we have a protocol in place for absent students. So if a teacher has a student that's chronically absent, they have a form to fill out for us so that we can then start reaching out to those families. And then over here on the right-hand side, you'll see our responses to um, the recent fires. So since um, with the, all the smoke in the air and everything going on, we know that a lot of families were feeling a lot of extra stress and trauma from the past fire, from Paradise Fire. And so we wanted to reach out. We made sure to reach out to all those families that were affected at that time. We sent out resources to parents, to the teachers. We created a video with coping um, techniques for the students and just reminded the teachers um, that we were there and remind, reminded the families. <clears throat> so um, it, well, that concludes our presentation, but it, it by far doesn't do justice to what our wellness team is doing and working with our um, entire school community. And they've done an amazing job responding to um, the challenges that we're facing in our community. And um, I'm very thankful. I mean, we all are very thankful that we have these resources that we're able to tap into. And I, I'm sure that the other school sites are feeling the same as what um, as what I am right now. And this kind of stuff is taking place across the district. So thank you for these resources. And um, thank you, Jackie and, and G for being here. Yeah, I just wanna thank Jackie and G also. Do you guys have any questions for them? I'm just wondering, um, you mentioned that there were 30, are there 30 people who are uh, the parents engaged in the in the group so far? Those were um, responses to our survey. We mm. haven't done the group yet. Okay. Um, our first one is on October 15th, and we're going to be doing it as a meet and greet. Um, so hopefully building those connections okay. between parents. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sierra View. So as usual, the elementary folks, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I just just wanted, I, I, I hope the uh, Sierra View people are still on the line. <clears throat> I just wanted to let you know that my lack of a question does not indicate a lack of support. The work you're doing is just amazing and just wanted to say thank you so much. Same, I'm really thrilled by this program and the program you guys put in place, thank you. And as I started to say, as usual, the elementary group are always raising the bar and setting the bar. I, I just want to remind the board of our mandated trainings that we are providing this school year. Those have not gone away. They are uh, being implemented. Suicide prevention, bullying, human trafficking is more defined this year, and then LGBTQ awareness. So I do appreciate, again, Diane Olson for making sure we included the educationally related mental health services that have been expanded to, um, to to more groups, our students with IEPs. And specifically, I wanna highlight the um, opportunity for our students with 504s. Oftentimes, those accommodations and modifications that need to support those students aren't at the forefront. 
and I want to be sure that we highlight that that is definitely something that has been a focus for this year. Erica Smith and her and her team has always made sure our web page is updated, and I want to. The reason we included this last definition, emergency response team, unfortunately, we had to we had to mobilize that team this year, and I was extremely impressed with the collaboration amongst the different school sites to be sure that one of our school site staff was supported. So then that staff, if if they were able, were, able, were available to support their students. So that team was critical uh, this fall. So again, coming back to Oak Bridge, we were able to add some counseling time. We added some targeted case manager time uh, because of their numbers. It's not that we didn't feel like they needed it, but the numbers in the past hadn't warranted mainly because of the, the um, conversations the teachers were able to uh, provide to their students. But because of the numbers, we did increase some of our staff and the elementary counselors, as you've already seen, they're, they're right on it. They have developed the Oak Bridge wellness page for their website. Okay, next steps. So we had some other um, things planned to talk about tonight on next steps, where we are at uh, purple. That at the time when we were making this presentation for you, we were in purple. Now we we're in red, obviously, um, for the modified traditional schedule. So we're going to kind of um, go over that in a presentation right in a few minutes. But uh, next steps after red goes to orange. Um, then yellow, I have not seen our numbers yet for today. Um, yesterday we had six, I believe, in Butte County, which would have put us in the orange for that day. Uh, but then we want to continue um, our con communications with families about our pre preparation for full or in-person um, returns. So that's our, would have been our next steps, but we're going to be talking about that again tonight, about in-person since we have changed since we started uh, these conversations for this workshop. Any questions before we conclude? No, but I do just want to thank the staff for all their work in putting this presentation together, but all that they are doing for our students. It's pretty amazing seeing all these different steps. It's appreciated very much. I do believe, Ms. Griffin, that we have three people um, that turned in cards for comments. Okay, um, we do not actually have a decision to make with regards to this, and so these, uh, whatever comments are made would just be for the sake of, uh, you know, people providing input, which of course is always welcome, um, but we, at the end of this, we are not going to be making a decision with regards to this topic, so um, yes, we can go ahead then with uh, speakers who want to speak on this topic. Okay, I'll be calling Matt Tennis. Oh, is this Matt? Okay, Matt, hold for a second, and I'm going to put you on speaker. Okay, Matt, you are addressing the Tuco Unified School District. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Matt Tennis, a uh, parent of four kids here in town, uh, three of whom are enrolled with Chico Unified and one of whom is only two years old, and also uh, representing Chico parents for in-person learning. Um, I thought that was a great presentation, and I, too, appreciate the work of the staff and um, I appreciate it also in the context of the fact that we're in a big crisis right now with a global pandemic going on that no one wanted. Um, me and my coalition, we think that the virus is real uh, and not something to be completely ignored or disregarded, but we want to um, value in-person learning to the degree that it needs to be valued. And um, I think that the report tonight was a little bit of a, of a, of a Chico Unified's greatest hits and it's a, definitely an album worth owning. Um, there are amazing things being done by all the presenters we heard tonight. Um, and uh, the teachers are working very, very hard to try to make this bad situation as good as it can be. Um, but I think that we need to remember all the little square pegged students out there. And I always remember those because I was one of those when I was a kid. And I've got one or two of them living under my roof. And uh, for those kids, uh, Zoom school is a terrible situation, and, and they're missing uh, 
just a huge chunk of what they hear. These kids are up and down, in and out of their seats all the time. I'm not just speaking of my own children. I'm speaking of the, uh, the, the students who I'm hearing about from their parents who are members of our coalition. And you can read some of these stories in your public comments, uh, which if you're watching this, uh, this pr uh, presentation, I think that anyone should go and read the public comments uh, presented because they are um, they're the other side of what we're hearing tonight. They're the bad experiences. So that said, um, I understand you guys are under a lot of pressure, uh, but I think that we should realize that this is not a great situation. So anything we can do to see how the negative aspects would be good, like, like maybe if we could see how many minutes students are spending on Zoom, uh, if we can get that information, that would be good, because I would bet that a lot of, there's a lot of uh, kids that are, there's a lot of Zoom, Zoom time that's, that's not taking place with kids who are getting full credit for attending, but they're not on their Zoom calls. Um, and uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you so much. Okay, we will move to our next caller. Okay, I'll be calling J.C. Merritt Cudney. Hi, is this JC? Hi, JC. Just hold for a second. I'm going to put you on speaker. Thank you, John. Okay, JC, you are you are addressing the school board. Hi, thank you. I'm calling as both a parent and a teacher in the district. Um, I'm calling, and I actually have. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm calling as um, a parent and a teacher. I think that the teachers have done amazing. I am a resource teacher in the district, so I go to multiple Zooms a day. I have seen some amazing work that the teachers have done. Um, they have built relationships, to echo what Ted said. They have built relationships in this online environment. So I'm calling to ask for a third option for students to be online and still connected to their home school. I um, think that there is a big group of parents in the district who don't feel comfortable sending their students back quite yet, but who really want their kids to be connected to the school that they have built these relationships with. Um, I think that uh, my own son's school has done an amazing job. My own son is, um, he is on a health 504. He does have one kidney, so I feel like the option between pulling him from those connections that he's made with the incredible teachers that he's had to make him leave that and disrupt them in an already disrupted year is punitive. That, it, that there should be a way for him to be online but still be connected. And as a teacher, I feel like that's completely doable. Um, I do feel like we can still do a hybrid model where we can address those needs but still um, teach both online and in person. And um, that's, that's it. Oh, I also believe that that would solve some of the secondary issues with reopening, the um, space issues, because I do think that a lot of parents would choose that option. So there might be, that might open up that so that there could be more social distancing. I do also think that um, it could help with the the ability to clean in between classes. So, thank you. Okay, we'll take our next caller for okay, three minutes. Okay, I'm going to call Lindsay Munn. Lindsay Munn. I received a voicemail. 
Was there another person who was on the list for this? She was the third and last. Okay. And that concludes our presentation then, if, unless the board has any more questions. Any questions? No questions. Okay, well, I guess we can move on then. Thank you very much um, for all of the hard work in doing this. And I think, Tom, you were the liaison. And was there another liaison? Linda. 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 Thank you both for helping out with this as well. Um, our next um, item here is the elementary school waivers and cohort updates. So thank you for letting me share a little follow-up information. So we met about three weeks ago, and we were kind of charged from the board to go out, get a little more information, and see what interest there was out there to look at cohorts or even waivers from school site levels. So all the elementary schools went out and resurveyed their families. They sent them out typically, uh, most, a lot of them did it from actually a classroom level with classroom follow-up calls. So results range anywhere from about 35% responses up to one of the schools actually had about a 97% response rate. So they definitely did a whole bunch of follow-up calls trying to really get a sense of what are families looking to have happen as far as a waiver possibility or even a cohort possibility. Um, and I'm gonna kind of, you know, it's site by site. I don't know, John, can you pull it up or John Vincent? And it is a mixed bag of information to put it mildly with what schools are interested in and what they feel like they could put in place and get agreement to also with a waiver. I think there was a lot of interest, um, I would say much more interest in cohorts in general and actually some of them have, have started their cohorts already and if you think for the public listening, we have the ability to bring students back in small kind of targeted groups um, for different levels of support. Everything from students with IEPs are coming back currently some students at different sites are coming back. Some of our transitional kindergartens have started cohorts or are starting them next week because there's a real desire with younger kids. Uh, I mean, I think if you ask anybody, a real strong belief that it certainly is hard for a four-year-old to be doing things on Zoom versus in person. So a lot of the TK teachers in particular were real desiring to start bringing them back in a cohort manner, and they're able to do those kinds of things. So a couple sites have actually started that now. Lots of school sites have been bringing cohorts back, meaning kind of small groups of students for targeted instruction with their, um, what we would call RTI, or response intervention, kind of like small tutoring support group for those listening that may not know all the school acronyms. And there's some that have interest in waivers, but I would say nothing on a site-wide basis. So there's some grade levels that we're very interested in doing things at certain sites. Um, some K-1 possibilities at some sites that we're interested to come back like that, and we would be open to moving forward with those kinds of opportunities. Um, some grade levels in particular, some individuals were interested. I think definitely more interest in cohorts and moving ahead in that capacity, though, of things. I would say, you know, the sites are still in progress right now. I don't say we've stopped this discussion because we kind of need to see what next steps the board would like us to be moving at this point. So I think, but once we kind of move to red status, I think a lot of the... Um, processing and planning kind of, I don't want to say it's paused because they're still definitely having discussions and those things are happening, but I think we're kind of waiting to see what next step the, the board would like us to be taking from this evening as well. So I think, um, like I said, there are some that were very happy. Our CUTA bargaining group was very supportive, helping us kind of process those through because we wanted them to take a look at them and make sure it matched up to what their members were looking for as well. So I think um, Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Moretti did a good job kind of putting together a very, um, abbreviated version of what a waiver might look like and kind of opening up some flexibility to help those things process through really quickly. And I'm trying to think, let's see, we've got about about eight or ten sites having different cohort groups coming through currently. And I think there's about three or four more that have been sent back in the last day or two that have been approved and they're hoping to start in the next couple of days also. Actually, so, there's about a dozen more. Is there so more? Okay, they've been trickling through. Cohorts have been trickling through very quickly now. Okay. Yeah, and they're much easier than the, um, than the, uh, the, the general waivers. So... So um, many of the teachers and groups have been um, choosing the cohort waiver instead. And I, and I would say just to remind folks listening also, for us to do things and, and be able to bring students back via a cohort is a much less cumbersome, complex process as far as kind of the negotiation end of things and kind of processing through all the state requirements as well. They're able to do it in a much more timely manner, kind of site driven by teacher interest with it and parent interest with those kinds of things. So I think it's not that schools aren't interested in a waiver process, they're just kind of, um, they, they, they could move a lot quicker with a cohort process to get students coming back in. I think you ought to give a definition of what the cohort waiver is, because we weren't really discussing that the last time and people mm. may not understand. So for folks that are listening, a cohort, schools have the capability to bring back a group of 14 students 
and with kind of some social distancing requirements and some health precautions in place. And if they can meet those requirements, they have the ability, if they're interested and open and comfortable doing those kinds of things, they can bring that cohort back and start providing instruction. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of requirements on that cohort also. They can't kind of cross mix with other students. They're really, it's a very solitary unit, and that's kind of an odd description for it, but they're not able to, they, a student can't be in a cohort with their um, Title I teacher getting small group instruction and a cohort with their classroom. So it's, a, it's hard to kind of mix and match those things. They really can't. That's one of the rules about cohorts. They're, they can be in one group to come back and kind of receive some in-person instruction. So, Mr. Sullivan, I just want to emphasize, too, that teachers cannot be in more than one cohort as well. Correct. Teachers and students. So it's to do it in a cohort, there's certainly some complexities. But like I said, expediency-wise, they were able to do those things a little bit quicker without kind of some of the, I don't want to call it red tape necessarily, but all those conditions and requirements at the state. Uh, had put into bringing students back in person. So there's several that have expressed some level of interest in waivers, and I think they are still kind of having discussions at their site as far as how that may look or how it may work with grade levels interested in doing some of those kinds of things. So I think we're just, um, nothing to bring forward now for a vote particularly, but I think uh, depending on direction we head tonight, you may be having some come forward in, on, at the next board meeting October 21st. So yeah, questions, and I, I, I'm not trying to be vague, but it's really, like I said, it's really a wide cross-section of interest and results and information, and it even varies even within a school site that some grade levels were interested, but others were not. Um, even class by class, interest with some of those things. Well, and that was the reason why we did it this way is because that's what we assumed is that there were, were going to be these distinctions and some people would want it, but those might be very you know, specific type of, type of groups. So that's, that's really not surprising, but, but there are so many. That's that's what's really interesting is they really, you know, embraced this. I, I think if you ask teachers, they they you know families out there we're hearing from are strongly desiring to be back in person for all the kind of the information you've been hearing leading up to this. Teachers are equally desiring to do those mm -hmm. things. You know, as long as we as long as they feel it's in a safe, right. you know, kind of secure kind of manner with those things, and those that have been interested have really kind of um, been taking advantage of this cohort opportunity. And maybe more control as well. Uh, yeah, they're really kind of driving the boat if they're coming back in that cohort manner and having a lot of kind of control over the conditions of it and putting it in place in a way it's going to work for them and for their students also. Okay. And I wouldn't interpret the lack of the waivers coming forward as lack of interest because about the same time we were having those conversations, we were moving from purple to red, and, mm -hmm. and the waivers are quite uh, paper intensive, and then there's another approval level at the uh, public health right. um, department. So, so I think when we started to move into red, um, they kind of put those, as Ted said, on the back burner yeah. and just kind of waited. Where the cohorts were literally um, sitting down, and you could complete it in a day, and then it goes on to C, uh, the CTA for final approval and that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty Sort easy. of fast track. Very fast, very <laughs> fast track. Eileen? Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, you've worked on how to continue the cohorts if we go to the AMPM um, elementary, m m well, they'd all be AMPM, but if we go to opening <clears throat> on the 19th, we've figured out how to make it work? Some of the, like one of the TK cohorts in particular that started over at Hooker Oak already has kind of been started with that in mind that that may be coming the next step with it. So they would be able to continue with, with the structure they've got put in place now. Okay, so as I'm considering what to approve, I can just r rely on the fact that the other stuff that's already worked on and figured out won't be significantly impacted. I, no. I would also say um, on the 21st, sorry, Mr. Hanley, that on the 21st, I think that we put the waivers on the agenda <coughs> in case we want them on to be approved, just in case there's a movement one way or the other, mm -hmm. and that we have the waivers done. And if the board sees at that time that they want to approve those to move to the, um, to the health department, Butte County Health Department, if we move into purple, or if there's some reason we have to go back onto online, that that is available for the county to approve or not approve us. So I, oh, wait, yeah. I would just think on the 21st that we might be prepared to bring, if we have some schools available, I, to go. Yeah, I would like to have it on the agenda for the 21st, kind of pending the direction from the board at this point. That Can makes I, sense, thank you. I'd like you. to interrupt too, the uh, Superintendent Staley does have her hand up. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we answered uh, Mrs. Robinson's 
question. I don't think that all cohorts can continue if we come back in an in-person model. So, so I, I've been had my hand on all the cohorts, um, so I can answer that. Many of them, in fact, um, all of them at several schools um, had the AMP model in mind, and so that they could easily transition into them. Um, and many of them are special ed um, and um, and targeted other targeted groups who simply wanted. Even with the change, the possible change over to AMPM indicated that they wanted to see their students sooner rather than wait for a board decision that could possibly happen or not on October 19th or, or around that time. So a lot of them were 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 um, designed within mind of the AMPM, but also if they just wanted to see their students immediately because they were concerned about right. those targeted students falling further and further behind. So, with the 21st in mind, and and. Uh, if we go and get that other waiver, and we, it, it does it help us keep those already established cohorts in place? So the cohorts, even if um, even depending on the board decision, the cohorts will be in place. They're approved. So right, if we go into AMPM, they're kind of a moot point at that point. But they're there um, to be to fall back on if we fall back into red, into and the board, purple, and, or into purple, and the, yes. and the board okay. makes a decision to close the schools Thank back you. down again. Yes. So any questions? I think we're, I mean, there certainly Mr. is a wide range of interest in. What? Mr. I just want to, oh. if I may answer Eileen, some won't, like at the secondary level, the teacher wouldn't be able to continue the cohort in the AMPM model because they'll already be teaching that period. At the elementary level, a lot of them will be able to continue. And I think that's what Kelly was shooting for. So many or most may continue. Some, it just wouldn't be feasible unless we go back to online. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Any other questions? Kathy, Tom? So once again, this is not a, it's really a discussion item at this point. There's really yeah. nothing forward for the board. Right. We, uh, yes. We do have some calls for this. We do. We have two speaker cards. Okay, and as mentioned before, we do not have to make a decision. We're not going to take action, but we would like to hear uh, these people. So give us the first. Okay, I'll be calling Matt Tennis. Hey Matt, just hold for a second and I'll put you on speaker. Okay, Matt, you are addressing the school board. Hello again, uh, Matt Tennis with Chico Parents for in-person learning. And uh, I have to confess um, on behalf of myself and also my coalition, we're disappointed with um, with the, the lack of leadership that has been demonstrated by the board on this issue. Um, as of, uh, gosh, almost two months ago, uh, Governor Newsom, uh, through his administration, made available this opportunity for schools to pursue uh, waivers for elementary uh, schools so that kids who might be having a really tough time with the online Zoom-based format could get back to in-person learning. Um, early on when we here at Chico Unified started surveying uh, parents and teachers and classified and certificated staff, uh, there was a pretty, pretty good consensus that uh, going back to elementary schools under a waiver was a good idea. And you had all that information, but you guys did not take any action, did not demonstrate any leadership to try to, to, try to scramble and come up with good options, you know, maybe just two or three that, that could be more universal in their application, maybe submit something to the county. Um, all you guys have done is basically just kick it back out to school sites, you know, sort of repeatedly just kind of keep throwing it out to the school sites. And um, part of me wonders if maybe you wanted this waiver concept to just sort of uh, just sort of struggle and, and die. And uh, I think that was not a very good decision. I don't think that served your constituency very well. And I really wish that uh, this current board would, would not do nothing, as President Griffin has already indicated. They're not going to take any action. Um, it's interesting that she would know that, but the bottom line is I think that somebody should propose some kind of action under the waiver because we don't know what the future holds. Nobody has a crystal ball. Maybe when Chico State students all come back, we could have a big resurgence of cases. Maybe we'll move. 
out of orange into red, or maybe we'll move from red back into purple. Um, a waiver would give elementary schools the protection to operate at a time when we are so desperately need them, and for this age group that is uh, so naturally and physically and scientifically protected from the coronavirus. So thank you very much. Eileen, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, I, um, I'm confused at Mr. Tennis's statement because what we just presented was all of the action that we took immediately as soon as the process for getting cohorts approved through the county became available to us. We've, we've had these um, in-person cohorts functioning at the school sites um, as soon as, as that process became available to us. So I, 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 I don't understand a complaint about not moving. We moved as quickly as the process was available to us. Those kids have been in their cohorts receiving the attention they needed. Uh, the special ed program children have been extremely well covered by the, the programs that were developed and the, the cohorts that were put together. And um, the, uh, the timelines that have allowed us to do what we have up to approve tonight weren't available to us before now. Yes, and you just mentioned that um, the whole reason why these waivers are going to be held is should the circumstances change, they will be ready to utilize. This is a fluid situation. We're not dealing with something that has remained the same over time. And in addition, we did survey people, and um, the surveys did not indicate an overwhelming uh, desire for all schools to apply for waivers. And so, um, you know, I realize that this is a political issue and um, I really wish that uh, instead of focusing on what hasn't been done, um, you would focus on what has been done. Okay, do we have another speaker? We do, I'll be calling Jody Taylor, Jody Taylor. on the speaker and you'll be addressing the board. Just hold on for a second. Okay, Jody, you are addressing the Chico Unified School Board. Okay, thank you. Good evening, board members. Um, I just, I wanna echo Mr. Tennis's comments that the process for the waiver should still move forward. Uh, so it is in place um, because like you mentioned, uh, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Robinson, I, I apologize. I, I mean, Ms. Griffin, I apologize. Uh, the process still needs to move forward uh, so that it is on file and in place so that we're not bouncing back to distance learning because as you mentioned, it is a fluid situation. Things are changing. Um, and so this gives us a safeguard in place to provide continuity for our kids. Uh, and so it was mentioned earlier that it, it's good to propose a solution and a suggestion um, in, in place of just negativity. And so I wanna do that. Um, Here's mine. Uh, given that elementary schools are going to be going to AMPM, I feel like the solution and the suggestion is for the district to take the reins of this back and to apply for the waiver, uh, once again, just as an entire district. Uh, let's, let's apply for the waiver based on the AMPM model that's been approved and then add the safety information that is site specific to the application that the district submits as a whole district. Um, I really feel like that's the only way to be equitable. Um, I have a big concern about cohorts. I know it's much more streamlined to approve these and to approve small groups, but where is the equity in having site-specific de determinations made? If I have a third grader at Sierra View whose school decides to form a cohort and they can go back to school, but somebody else has a third grader at Marigold Elementary and they, they opted not to do the same thing, that third grader is not being provided the same opportunity that that the other child is. And so I think in the, in the interest of equity and fairness to all of our kids, the waiver process just should be a top-down top thing. 
and um, I'll just I'll just leave my comments there for now. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our next item, and that item is. Ms. Griffin, may I interrupt? Yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know: Is it still possible for a speaker from three one one who who you got the voicemail for? Is it uh, too late for her to? We had a speaker on item three one one who for whom we called and got voicemail. Are we past the point of no return on that one? Okay. She just didn't get to the phone in time, it sounds like. You know, at the end of this, yeah. I have a feeling this is going to take a while if she wants to hang around. And at the end of this, if she has something she still would like to say, we will make sure she has an opportunity. I think that's a good solution. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our next item is um, discussion action item regarding stage two, red tier, return to in-person instruction in a modified traditional AMPM model. So we will be discussing that. Thank you. Okay, let's see if we're going to get this pulled up for us, Mr. Vincent. Thank you. All right, so originally we presented this to the, to the board back in July 15th of 2020. Now we are again um, presenting it to you tonight. Below you can see um, if people want to follow um, the slide, that's a bit.ly and then we'll have this on, every, on the next few slides so if they want to write it down so the people out in the public um, want to follow along the slides themselves, that'll be on that bit.ly, okay? Again, the timeline that, um, that we went over earlier, and I'm not gonna kind of drum that down, but um, again, we started back in March. Again, on July 15th, we believed that we were going to A&P M. We uh, to a modified traditional schedule that at that time the board approved to go to an A&P M model. Uh, we were um, ready to move forward with that on our August 14th date. And then again, we got changed back to into what the, is now called the purple status. And so we went into online. So we're back again now. We've been put into the red status. So what brings us here today for this presentation. Okay, sorry. Okay, our timeline that we're looking at for right now is tonight we're gonna present the reopening update to you guys. Tomorrow, um, the district and CUTA will be meeting um, to do our negotiations, which we'll talk about what we need to do that before we, move, we can move forward. We are hoping, and I'm, and I'm not gonna wanna speak for Ms. Moretti or Mr. Moretti or Mr. Hanlon, but our goal is to try to finish that negotiation and get an MOU by the end of tomorrow, as long as that needs to be taken. If not, we will try to add more dates. Again, I don't wanna speak for Mr. Moretti on that. Uh, but that's what our hope is. And then on uh, August 15th and 16th, we're hoping to have transition days. Again, this is all pertaining on what action happens at the end of the end of this, I mean, sorry, October, at the end of this presentation. And um, this is what we're presenting to you guys tonight. So uh, October 15th and 16th would be transition days where we would give our teachers, and we'll again discuss that in negotiations tomorrow to hope that we can offer them some some days to get ready for the transition if the board chooses. And then October 19th would be the very earliest uh, that we believe that we could be ready to go um, back to, um, to school and bring our kids back to school in some type of modified traditional program. Then we have the October 21st board meeting and we will go over the reopening and then again you see the dates going into winter break. Safety guidelines, I'm gonna have Mr. Boltima kind of go over those for us right now. Um, if you may. So as a reminder, on uh, in July, the board approved the safety guidelines. Um, and you'll see those here. We are going to be asking the board to make one modification to these moving forward. The previous uh, guidelines had taking temperatures um, in the access entry locations of all of our schools based on guidance from Butte County Health and also understanding that that would create quite the bottleneck and really make social distancing almost impossible, um, we're recommending to the board that we take that uh, piece out related to our guidelines. We do have over 750 um, touchless thermometers that have been purchased and are available to all teachers 
um, and staff if they see that um, somebody may need to be have their temperature taken um, so that we do have those available. Specifically in addressing the guidelines, however, I want to let the board know that hand sanitizer dispensers are installed in every classroom throughout the district um, except for Marsh Junior High School. And there are a couple locations um, that we're waiting for a back order of those dispensers. They were delivered today and will be implemented uh, this week. Um, hand sanitizer dispenser stands have been uh, purchased and our hope is to post those at every entry point and exit point at all of our schools. Um, we are looking at purchasing additional items as well so that we can have those on um, PE blacktops in those areas. Uh, social distancing signage will be installed on the ground uh, and all doors that will be done by an outside agency. That work will be done next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, custodians will be using the microfiber cleaning system that we've talked to the board about previously. And all of the uh, washing machines will be installed as well. The elementary schools um, will be cleaned in between an AM, PM model uh, by custodians. Uh, the secondary uh, classrooms, however, um, we are unable to get to every classroom during the passing periods. So our attempt is to have um, a, a product for cleaning called uh, hypochlorous or also neutral electrolyzed water um, that would be available in the classrooms for use by teachers or by um, students if they desired. We're also looking at um, possibly having an outside service provide microfiber cloths that um, from what we read is about 93% effective in eliminating germs and viruses on hard services in classrooms. That would be a weekly service that we're looking at right now. Um, custodians uh, and support staff will be wiping down high touch areas throughout the day, including doorknobs, um, light switches and our heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, also called HVAC systems, um, are having their filters replaced this week with MERV 13 rated filters. Typically we do that on a quarterly basis. Uh, however, with the fires in the area, we note that those need to be changed now. Uh, and there has been a challenge with getting those in supply. So that is um, our typical process is, is replacing those quarterly, and that would be our goal. Um, and we're trying to order them as quickly as we can so that they can be here. So with all those in place, we think we're going to be addressing uh, the guidelines that the board had previously approved. And at the end of the presentation, we do request that the board um, approve the updated guidelines with the removal of the temperature checks at entrance points. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Boltima before we move on? I'm sorry, Linda, any questions? For Kevin about the safety? Okay, thank you. Oh, great. Um, as we discussed back in July, um, our per personal protective equipment, Chico Unified will require protective facial coverings for staff and students during the school day. That has not um, changed from the July 15th. This includes cloth or disposal facial coverings or facial she shields for students and staff. Food handlers and healthcare staff will wear and require all. PPE equipment. Again, um, I don't know if Mr. Baltimore, if you want to kind of talk about what's going to be happening with the signage that'll be happening next week. Uh, we do have an outside uh, company that we purchased signage for all of our school districts. So on the ground, on concrete, and on linoleum, and in on carpet as well, we'll have the little round dots that uh, ask to maintain six feet social distancing. And we'll have signs on all, every, every door um, that will also note um, safety precautions and, and washing hands and social distancing as well. That will be a standard across all of our schools, and those will be installed within the three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, we are providing the vendor the layout of each school with the different locations for those. Um, I will say we're not going to get that perfect right out of the gate, but again, we'll follow up in areas that we need to make sure that we have the correct signage, or those items on the ground so that people can designate and see that spacing requirement. We'll get that done as well. Thank you, Mr. Boltma. Also, uh, families are recommended to take te daily temperature checks before they send their child to school. Anyone with a fever over 100.4 degrees or higher may not go to a school site. Anyone with a fever of 100.4 degrees or higher at school will be sent home. 
Um, students, adults were asking our families to do wellness checks on their child before they sent them to school. Um, the temperature checks, cold, cough, all the different things that we're looking for. We're asking families to do that before they send their child to school. Um, student, students returning um, will be required to have at least one designated family member available to pick them up at any time should they become ill. Again, for safety reasons. Social distancing, which uh, Mr. Boltman just went over, social distancing signage will be placed in high traffic areas, as he talked about. We also recognize that six foot distancing may not be possible at all times. As a result, facial coverings will be required at all times. Physical barriers will be installed as determined by administration in high traffic areas where on campus where social distancing is not possible, such as front offices and cafeterias, which a lot of that's already been done. Appreciate our maintenance and operation group for that. Classroom furniture and equipment will be arranged for social distancing to do the greatest extent possible. Yes. So when you talk about the physical barriers, are you talking about the clear plexiglass? Yes, sorry, okay, the plexiglass that's that been that. played. Uh, displayed in our offices and right. we have them um, on a lot of different places for our speech teachers or special ed right. and stuff like that. Also I know some of the schools are not using the plexiglass but they'll be using signage to go one way um, on certain hallways. I know that they are planning to do that in the Yale building here at Pleasant Valley High School. Okay, thank you. All right, stages of reopening and line instruction models. Stages of reopening are decided based on the color tier placement of the county. Chico will, Unified will implement instructional models specifically aligned with the stages of reopening. As stages change, we will adjust instructional mo models offered. So right now, and I'll go over that, we were in purple tier, and as of three weeks ago, I think we're in our third week, um, uh, we got moved from purple to red. So again, when we held this back in July, stage one is now called purple. Again, our state has decided to change how we dictate from stages to colors. Um, so we've changed that so families, again, bear with us when we go from purple, from stage one, and those types of things, understand we are now following the state guidelines when it comes to that. We are now in the red tier, stage two, lower risk workplaces, modified school programs, and child care reopen. Again, we already have, and I'll have, later we'll talk about our workday um, child supervision. Orange tier means that we could bring back kids full time all day with the safety guidelines in place. Remember, all the guidelines we showed you earlier are all applicable for all of our stages. Okay, so next, yellow, yellow tier, end of the stay at home order, return to expanded workforce and highest risk workplaces. So that means we would not need um, the safety precautions, if um, my understanding, if we go to yellow, but we would most likely ask the board if we wanted to keep um, some or all. We just want to remind the board of what is available uh, currently. It's been available for three years now, We're working on a fourth year. Oak Ridge Academy is um, dedicated uh, to serve its population. It is a school of choice and it has been um, serving needs of students. So just through this slide in here to remind people of some of the parameters related to Oak Ridge, that they can slide back and forth uh, between the Oak Ridge site and their comprehensive site. Um, John, I have a question real quick. Uh, I had gotten a few emails about parents who were concerned that if they did do uh, the Oakdale model, that, Oak Bridge, I'm sorry, uh, that they would have to graduate from that if they, you know. So how do you figure where students have to graduate? I thought that with this one, they could also take some classes before they could have just taken other classes too at say Chico High or, or PV High. So how do you determine where they actually get a diploma from? So there are multiple ways to, de to make that determination. Just to say philosophically, our goal right now with everything that's going on is to be as flexible as we possibly can be. If a student has been at Chico High School, for example, for three years, moves over to Oak Bridge, and second semester we're still in a situation and that student wants to graduate from Chico High School, we will do everything we can to make sure that person gets a Chico High School diploma. Um, we have multiple generations of loyalty to our schools, so we wanna make sure we, we honor that. We do have hybrid schedules where students take four classes at a high school and take two classes at Oak Bridge and vice versa. So the ADA is the, the reason we have a 4-2 split because if we have a student only taking three courses at either one of those um, schools, we don't get ADA for either. 
and we try to avoid a single a single class um, situation because then we get into I'll just say it very generically teacher shopping the student decides he or she doesn't want to have that teacher anymore and they just you know they, they go to the different program so we can move people back and forth but we are committed to being as flexible as we need to be to meet meet student needs this is a unprecedented time thank you John I have a question as well to piggyback on that for Mr. Shepard. Sure. So I've been getting some emails as well, and um, there's maybe some misinformation because not only the graduation part is something I've seen, but also um, if parents opt at this point in time to take their student to Oak Ridge, will they need to remain at Oak Ridge for the rest of the semester? That's question number one. And uh, the other question that I've been hearing or concern I've been hearing, if they opt to take their children to Oak Bridge, they're going to lose their spot at their neighborhood school, their elementary neighborhood school. So I'd like you to address those two things, please. Well, thank you for the opportunity because it save, could save us some more phone, or phone calls and emails. So to answer your, your first question, uh, because Oak Bridge is a program of an alternative education independent study, by ed code, we have to move students back to the comprehensive site. We try to do that during grading periods, so the end of a progress report, a semester, because that's the best time we've found to do that. But by ed code, uh, parents do have the right to return to the comprehensive site. So I want to make sure okay. parents know that. And again, we, are, we feel an obligation to return people to the program that was meeting their needs prior to everything that was happening. And I can see Mr. Sullivan nodding his head. We have very impacted programs, very successful, and people want to get into those programs. Mm -hmm. However, we are going to do everything we can to, to guarantee those students those spots back in their programs. Thank you. Inclu very sorry, good. one more thing, including Form 10s. Uh, one last thing, if I can, uh, Ms. Avi. We do want to yes. emphasize that students who attend Oak Ridge are eligible to compete in athletics at their neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. And Linda, in the elementary world, I, I don't see that as a problem right now as far as being able to get students back into their neighborhood school. Great, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Okay, I'm gonna have Mr. Karras kind of talk about the survey data that we have from parents. So, a parent survey was sent out on uh, September 30th uh, asking parents if or when we return to school, given all the information that they know right now, uh, would they like to send their child back to school for in-person instruction or not, okay? And uh, safety guidelines were linked uh, in the message that went out uh, directing parents to uh, complete the, the survey. And uh, we are still in the process of collecting data right now. As you could imagine, that's a very short turnaround to send something out at the end of last week and, and have a complete data set for you. But we do have a significant number of surveys returned right now. Uh, we actually have survey, survey entries for almost 60% of our students. And so that's over 7,000 families or 7,000 um, students have survey entries. Of those survey entries, 85.4% answered yes, when in-person instruction begins, I would like to send my student back to school. 14.6, the remainder said no. So you can see the overwhelming uh, majority so far is to parents wanting to send their child back to in-person instruction. Um, I think that one of the things we've heard repeatedly from public comments and emails was that there, uh, many people felt there was a lack of nuance in this question. Um, I know some people understood it as, um, if I don't say yes, I won't get to stay at uh, my current school site, and others understood it to mean that if they said no, ingenuity would be their only choice. Um, so I'm a little concerned with how much uh, inference we try to gain out of out of this particular survey because I do know there was a lot of uh, concern about parents not knowing exactly what they were signing up for and what they were answering for. So you are correct on on 
on that. Uh, we will beginning after again after this board meeting and what the decision of what the board will be making those contact contacts back to our families because one of the things that we will be discussing in negotiations tomorrow and tonight will be the third option that we'll be offering parents. Um, we're hoping and. Um, and I believe this will happen, but again, I don't wanna step on anybody that, that will have an option if families wanna stay at their school site on an online version that we'll be able to offer that. Um, we are gonna work through that tomorrow uh, with Mr. Re Mr. Moretti and Mr. Hanlon and the negotiating teams on both sides, but we think that we have a plan for that in place. So we think that'll make families, and again, I think what you're trying to say, Mr. Lando, is that m n number might change a little bit when they find that out, and you clearly that might happen. I know that when we, surveyed our families back in the summer about if they wanted to have their child online um, or go back to uh, our school sites when we were thinking about A and PM. This is, bef they were choosing between Oak Bridge and at that time um, their school site, we were at about 70%. And again, our Oak Bridge model is sitting at about 528 um, students right now. So we know a lot of those families chose that coming out of the shoot because we told them if we're going back to A and PM, um, it's gonna be hard to get into Oak Bridge at that time, which we are, again, uh, pretty full at Oak Bridge, and we would have to add more staff there at this time if we were gonna go there. So we feel that a lot of our families chose Oak Bridge knowing that they wanted to be online no matter what, if, even if we went back to AMPM. So uh, do you think there's going to be any migration from, from Oak Bridge back into the schools? And we recently talked to the um, Rhonda Olam, who's in charge of, mm -hmm. of that, and she's been in contact with her families. We believe we might get some, um, knowing the fact that we have online for them at their school site, so that might happen. Um, we will again, like Mr. Shepard said, that we have to accommodate that if they wanna go back to their school site, and we will do that. Um, again, that takes teachers to do that, and it's gonna be a puzzle that our um, schools are gonna have to work through and we're gonna to have to work through through negotiations, but yes. Just to share a little, Liz, we, when we started kind of collecting this data, there was a, a huge push, like Mr. Lando shared, from families kind of communicating us, we wanna stay connected to our current school site. Right. How can we do that? How can that be possible? We, you know, we, we love Rosedale in particular, or whatever the school might be. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna lose, we don't wanna leave this program that we've kind of signed up for. Oak Bridge doesn't offer that. So I think as soon as staffs started kind of getting that sense of things, I mean, they started coming to us saying, we don't wanna lose our families. We wanna figure out some way that we can put something forth to allow them to stay here, even if it's in an online structure. So there's been a lot of creative ideas that have been floated around by staff and, and administration also around this. I think we're gonna be talking about all those tomorrow at negotiations. Mm -hmm. And I hope, and I think, um, I, I think CUTA, the members I've been hearing from are really interested to allow some flexibility to allow those opportunities to be there for families to stay connected. And that's our hope is tomorrow we'll come out there with something that'll allow those things to happen. So yeah. President Griffin, yeah. at some point, I'd like to talk about negotiations. Yes. This may or may not be the, the appropriate time, but um, I do, we keep bringing it up and I right. kind of want to give the board an update on where we're at and um, what the challenges we uh, will be facing tomorrow. So um, at some point when you Yeah, I think this, this probably is a good time because we, we know that so much hinges on that. And right. as far as us being able to really consider something, right. we need to know if the potential is there, you know, for this to actually occur. And that could... Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. Because it was directly related to the switching in and out of Oak Bridge. Um, sure. Okay. Some of the um, the uh, emails and comments that, that I've got, the concern was that uh, classes that were uh, uh, available at, say, Chico High were not available at Oak Bridge, but if we are able to maintain online at the school site, we can solve that problem. On the switch, if the student is at Oak Bridge, are they going to be able to change into those same classes if they want to now return to their home school? Yes, so to answer the first question, that, that's exactly what we're talking about with the third option. A great example of that is our AP classes mm -hmm. that are not available at Oak Bridge. And uh, we need to be able to provide opportunities for those students, and so if we can, tomorrow, and I think we're gonna go into, lang into negotiation conversation here in a second, if we can figure out the language that would accommodate those types of scenarios, it's a win-win. 
for, for as many students as possible. So we're really hopeful that we can uh, dedicate our time to that tomorrow. And so the second question about students having access to the same courses, they, the courses that are, when students shift back, typically in a pre-COVID year, they shift into very similar levels of courses. They may not be the exact same course, but they shift back to the same, same level. And that's how we've been doing it since Oak Ridge has opened. So that's, the precedent has been set for that. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm Go gonna ahead, jump on give in, Mr. An, an update, because I think these, um, some of the things that we're discussing in negotiations are gonna be critical for the decision you're gonna be, make tonight. So let me start with CSEA. So CSEA, we have had a number of meetings and we have exchanged um, first draft documents with them. So uh, while I don't wanna say we have a tentative agreement, we're, the, we're one step shy of that. Um, I did talk with their um, negotiating lead today, and there, there are some minor adjustments, but the, but the bulk of the document is pretty well set. In fact, we have reached agreement to, um, to continue on the online MOU with the major points, even if they, they haven't gone through their full adoption process, because it's a quite lengthy process. They have to release it to their members for 10 days before vote, and then it has to have a 610 process in Sacramento. So it's, that's well beyond the October 19th date. But um, we have agreed that the major points um, are going to be carried over into the, um, the new document, and they will not um, grieve the areas that we have um, um, agreed on with regards to transfer of people on short notice and working slightly out of your job description. Those are, those are the main points that we wanted, and they wanted the major things like um, COVID protection if they were to get sick for a long-term illness and not have... Um, um, be impacted through sick days. So uh, we both got what we wanted and um, it's just now we got to kind of wait to get through the process. So CSEA is, is pretty well set. Um, CTA, as has been said, we be, we'll be meeting tomorrow. Um, we have much of, the, much of the document in agreement, but there, there were some major issues. There were three or four major issues that we needed to resolve. Um, we think we have the answers going in tomorrow to, to make that happen. I've had prelim some preliminary um, talks um, an exchange of information on that with um, CUTA leadership. So uh, m my impression is they are as motivated as we are to get this done. Um, and uh, and uh, like uh, Jay said, if um, for some reason we don't get it done tomorrow, um, I would certainly be open to um, getting another date um, on the calendar very quickly to, to wrap things up. But a um, um, couple things. Um, as the th we're, we want to talk about that third option, and um, we'll be discussing that. The other thing is uh, that there has been some give and take on is the 50% caseload in, in a class at any given time. We can't guarantee six foot distancing with um, students, um, and, uh, and so CETA has come back and asked for a 50% max caseload, and that really ties in well with the AMPM, half and half as we go through. So uh, I think we're, we're in good shape there. Child care has been a major issue. We have some, um, some wonderful answers. Uh, Tina Keene has done a great job on working with CARD, um, so we think we have some responses there. Um, one, of the thing I, one of the things I just want to make uh, the board aware of is that um, we currently provide child care. If we don't continue to, ch to provide some kind of child care for um, our employees' um, children, um, they, can, they have access to the, uh, the, the, the state has, uh, gives a 12-week, um, which is a which is a three month um, basically child care leave. And so we need to continue to do that. Uh, we cannot hire teachers in the middle of the year. So we, if we're going to provide services, we need to provide the daycare. We think we have a great solution with CARD. They have been very cooperative and, um, and uh, we're gonna proceed forward on that. Um, obviously, the teachers also want that COVID protection. Um, just so you have an idea, uh, we have offered it um, during since the start of school. Actually, we start we have offered it since March, and uh, we have only had one employee um, get ill enough to take advantage of that. So while it's a very very small risk for the district, it's a great risk for the individual employees. So it's it's a great value for that person that if they should get it um, and get an extended illness, um, they would have access to it. So kind of the summary of this is, um, uh, given the uh, tenor of the negotiations with both groups, um, it has been very constructive, very positive, 
and um, I'm hopeful that we can reach agreement tomorrow. Um, I know that Kevin Reddy is on, and um, he may want to add his perception of, of, of things, but um, um, so I'm going to invite him to, to speak also to give you some feedback. Okay, Kevin, would you like to uh, share? Thank you, uh, and thank you, Jim. We are just as, as motivated as you are. Jim is, is a, a, a glass half full kind of guy. I think we can get it done, but it is such a long list and it just takes time to go through all that. Um, but uh, if he's confident, he's got the answers I wanna hear, then so am I. So hopefully we can can finish, finish tomorrow. That is, so the, the point would be, that is certainly our goal. CUTA's goal is to be able to finish if it's possible. And, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Kevin, remember, I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one other thing I do want to address because um, uh, in the last week or so, um, a different model has been um, approached and it has been brought forward, the AB model. Um, we did have discussions about that in the summer, uh, slightly different than, than what has been brought forward now. Um, we have been meeting on AMPM um, for, gosh, since July, because we thought we were coming back, then we kind of shifted gears into online, and then as soon as we got the online MOU and we started school, we immediately shifted back to the AMPM model. So there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of discussions, a lot of vetting, um, a lot of input from, from uh, staff, um, including a lot of teachers and administrators, in order to, to, um, to guide us in negotiations for the AMPM model. The AB model has some very good merit to it. However, to to stop and set aside APM, if, I just want to I just want to be real honest with you. If we set aside AMPM now and we go to AB, it's not going to be something we can we can um, resolve tomorrow. That's it's and that means uh, the earliest to, to open is is August 19th. I just don't see that as possible. There's just too much work to do. Um, another option. October, I'm sorry, October 19th. Um, another option may be to, um, for the board to consider um, adopting the AMPM and then we can step back and talk about a, the AB uh, model um, you know, while we are, still have kids in school. The difference between the two models, we talked about AB, which is a student will come to school every other day, all day long. Um, and the new model that has been proposed is that on those off days, teachers would live stream so, t so students would not um, miss any instruction on any given day. So it's day for day. Um, the good news is, is that we're, it's kind of back to normal in a sense that you have a day for day instruction rather than a half, half as much in the old AB model. The, the downside is that you have kids um, streaming all day long for six periods and that, and, and that's, that can be that can be pretty tough for some kids. Um, not saying that that's um, that's that doesn't mean we can't do it, but um, but but in order to get there, and in order, you can't just say you will live stream. That has that's a negotiated item. Um, that's gonna that's gonna resu result in some sig significant negotiations that could take a while to get there. Yeah, and, and I'm sure like all the rest of the board members, um, you know, I've been receiving numerous, you know, emails, particularly from teachers um, who are very much in favor of that model. Um, what would just, you know, uh, what kind of concerns me is that um, we've gone so far down the road with this AMPM model, and I know one of the reasons that we chose that was so that there'd be consistency between elementary and secondary in case families, you know, for families who are planning. But after reading the model um, that was proposed, the uh, alternating days, I do see that there's a lot of merit to that. But it would take really a long time, I think, to go through this whole process again, because we know how long it took you to get to this point where you would be able to have an agreement with the union about this because it, they, it has to be vetted with their members. Um, it, you know, all the, the little details have to be worked out, which you have spent since July with these organizations and teachers working out. So, you know, but the other thing that concerns me too is if we went with one and then we switched to another, it's kind of like we keep switching around too much, which also causes confusion. 
So um, it really is a bit of a dilemma, but we, if we do plan uh, to move forward with opening, at least in some capacity, and then that's another issue that I know a lot of people have brought up is, you know, they want the question answered, what's the big rush? You know, we realize we've gotten the feedback from parents that a lot of parents, they do feel they want it to happen like yesterday. But, um, you know, what would be the consequences of us waiting, postponing, if we do have this very large swell of support from, from teachers, if we were to delay and check out this plan, what would be the, you know, what would be the downside of that? That's, that's something we have to, we have to consider. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'll get you, Kathy, and then Tom. Okay. So um, I'm really concerned about um, introducing uh, another huge um, factor, uh, you know, throwing the dice. Um, the aspect of what the state has said is if we open by the 19th, then we can stay open. Uh, if we were to go through some extended potential discussion of an option that hasn't been vetted with everybody and it was only focused on secondary, so I think that's a really, really big issue. You have, you have teachers who are secondary with kids in elementary and you have the reverse. So I, uh, I do not want to there's an ad on TV right now where the guy has a car and he's whipping through the old timey sheriff thing, you know, with the horse, and then he rescues the woman on the track with the train. And Dr. Kaiser, that's like magic. Dr. Kaiser, we're just uh, getting word that it's hard to hear with the mask piece oh, on, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you can speak directly to yeah. that or. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry. What I, what I'm was saying is that. We've been working on a solution about how to return to school with controlled populations for a really long time. I don't think uh, we could have any potential of getting an agreement um, and open on October 19th. If we don't open on October 19th, then we have no guarantee that we would be able to open potentially at all. And so right now, Butte County is in a very good place. Uh, the data coming in is extremely low. Um, our hospitals have uh, lots of capacity. And here's, I think, a, a very encouraging aspect about health awareness in Butte County. In the hospital ordered 1,700 flu doses had two free clinics and they're all gone. And they're ordering more. People are paying attention. They are practicing better health than they were doing earlier. So um, Oroville Hospital is running a free clinic tomorrow uh, for flu. Uh, what my seven-year-old liked was there was no shot for the kids. They can just get it sprayed up their nose. Um, so the framework of this is, I think we have to continue to take the train down the track and not get off on a side road that might end us stalled. So um, a couple of things I want to address, so I apologize if I go a couple different directions. One is um, we are in a good place with our statistics at a county level now, that's, that's true. There's also great concern that part of that is because testing has been much lower since we have lost, we temporarily lost one of our testing sites during the fire. Um, my concern about saying get this done now so that we can get back in, do we want to bring students back if we believe that there's gonna be a jump back to purple at some point? That does not seem, I don't want kids back on campus because of a loophole if it's gonna be dangerous for them to be in groups later on. That seems um, cutting off one's nose to spite one's face. And if it's gonna remain safe and our numbers are good, we have time to wait, look at other options, and make a really sound decision. Um, and I urge us to be a deliberative body and not try and rush and get something done. 
on that note, I would really like to hear from Mr. Moretti, if he's still available, um, regarding whether or not the teachers have checked in with you. Is there a temperature check on this AB model? We've been getting a lot of uh, anecdotal feedback. Do you have any numbers? Uh, when, I, when I sent out my survey to secondary, I, I asked them for the, the short answer is everybody is evenly split pretty much on everything. Whether it's an AB model, the straight AB model, the alternating AB model, or the AB day. The, the one thing though that I did get a lot of feedback today that was people said, well, I didn't know I could vote for the AB day because the district had already, or I'm sorry, the school board had already voted for the uh, AM PM model. So, uh, but they don't want to take any more surveys. And anyway, it's on, if you ask any question that everyone, there is no consensus. There are pluses and minuses to all the models. Uh, and and I'm going to punt this question to you guys. <laughs> this is, this is going to be your decision. That's what we're for. Um, on, I would like to say that after hearing from Mr. Kessler earlier, um, the idea of having a day set aside for advisory and SEL check-ins and uh, professional development and PLC work is exactly the kind of educational model that I'm interested in. Um, getting teachers more time to collaborate in a regular school year would be is great and something we should be pushing towards. Uh, I think having that chance in an, in time like this when there are so many emergent needs um, should be one of our highest priorities, frankly. Um. Yeah, I agree with you on that one, Tom. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Eileen? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> I, I, my concern is we know that there's a significant, significant, okay, let's be exact. There's a majority of our population that wants in-person school in any model as soon as possible. And we have been hearing from the students at, at the secondary level, of course, because they're, they're able to say what they think. Thank goodness. If we were to all of a sudden say, okay, secondary kids, you're going to have to wait another month, five weeks maybe, for us to make up our mind. You're going to have to stay wherever you are, doing whatever you're doing, no in-person, no AB. I would not want to be in that household when that student got that message. We've already got so many kids on the brink of just absolutely coming apart because of the isolation for so long. My goodness, let's do AMPM and make it work as well as we can and not delay a decision. Ms. Well, Griffin? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I just, when you asked the question earlier, what are some of the reasons why we would or would not want right, to delay? Right, right. One is Ms. Robinson just say, just talked about, we're in a customer service business and our uh, customers are our students. And our students that we've been talking about in previous board meetings and their families have been telling us the, the emotional toll it's, it's taking on some of them for being in the house all day and not being around is, is, is adding up. And we've been, we said back in July that we are ready to go back into an AMPM model for us to come back out and say that we are not ready in October. Um, I feel we, with our cleaning that we have in place, that we're ready um, to go with, because one of the concerns is are we gonna be safe enough to come back with the steps that Mr. Boltema and the maintenance and operation has taken. I believe that that is ready. I believe through negotiations, um, as Mr. Moretti and Mr. Hanlon has expressed, we believe that we can get through that tomorrow or and we're in the next day or two. I'm, we're, we are really hoping on tomorrow and that we don't have to order dinner, but we are ready to do so. Um, I also believe um, that we have part of that is um, that we are ready to go um, educationally if we had to, because we have been planning for AMPM um, for from since July. I understand what Mr. Lando is saying about extra time, and again, but I, I worry about us going out to our community and saying that we um, are not ready and that our students would have to delay to go back to school when the county and the state are telling us um, that you're re you can go um, between uh, October 14th and 19th. That will give us a month that we've been in the red. So it was first we had to be in it for two weeks before they would even consider it. 
Now we're in our second two weeks of being in the red. So we, would have, we had to be in it for a month before they would allow us to go back to school. So again, I think that we would be ready to go if necessary. I think there was another issue too, um, something about the AB 98, that was another issue that impacted on um, the um, AB schedule being difficult at this time. Um, we have to Zoom a whole day. Right, so I don't know, John, yeah, are you the one who can best, best address can. that? And I'll get Tim Karras up here too, because he's the SB 98 guru. Um, we, do, we are required to provide daily engagement opportunities for students with at least one certificated uh, personnel. So there are, there are ways to do that. One of, the thing, one of the ways we'd be able to do that is through this third option we're talking about um, to provide students that daily engagement. And the, the requirement has not gone away. There's some misinformation that I've seen in different social media platforms that SB 98 would be addressed in just a standard AB model. Um, districts that are using AB are having to add an advisory period, which then increases the caseload for teachers. Okay, so, th so that then ties into the whole difficulty in presenting this to the, t the union and having that negotiated, correct? Because that's an additional time for the teachers, correct? Correct. And correct. or more students or, you know, it's, it's a change in their, in their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Any change in the working conditions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I was thinking. Yeah. Thank okay. You Wait a second, Linda. I think I'm going to yes. get to you, Linda, because I'm sorry I haven't seen you up there. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question, Liz. That makes makes a difference for me. Um, I absolutely agree with Tom. I had proposed this A B schedule in July when we were talking about it, but it got shot down kind of quickly, and I'm kind of sorry about that. But my thought had been to actually phase the students, bring the elementary students in, AM, PM, and then um, work towards the AB schedule for secondary. But with the change in working conditions, that's a bigger piece. So I would ask, you know, if we go to AM, PM, I think it was maybe Eileen said, you know, switching back and forth is not a good thing. I still would like to see the AB schedule. So if we started with AM, PM, I really would direct the staff, our, our district staff to work on negotiations to maybe by spring semester go into an AB model. I don't know how my colleagues feel about that, but it just really makes more sense. Our teachers have been clear in the emails I've gotten uh, that that is their preferred schedule. Um, you know, CTE purposes, sanitation purposes, there's just a lot of reasons, the advisory periods. So I don't know, I, I really would like to direct staff to work towards that AB model. Yeah, and I guess and the big question then would be, if that were the case, could the shift be, could that happen? Is it even feasible right, that that right. happen? That if you did start with AM, PM, could you shift a few months down the line? semester, I would think, but, and then we would be committed for the rest of the year, even if we went back to, you know, yellow tier or whatever, we'd still yeah. be in that model. Do you, do you have anything on that, Jim, that you'd so, like to so share? So, for, for a secondary perspective, yes, I'd have to defer to Ted on the elementary, but for secondary, um, you're still in class period, so regardless of what model you're in. So I think, John, you've done this too, that transition um, would not necessarily be, you know, easy and, and perfect, but um, it's certainly doable. I mean, we're still in class periods. We don't need to reassign kids. Um, it's really um, the transition in, in communicating that to parents and then, of course, any of the activities that kids are in after school are, are issues. If they're in sports and those types mm -hmm. of things, coming back, even if you're not in school that day, those kinds of things. Um, the only thing I would like to um, to say, I want to back up a little bit to the issue of collaboration. And, and I, and I, as principal at Chico High School, I was I was there when we initiated collaboration, and I totally support it. The only concern is is that in either one of these models, the students are only coming back for 50% of the instructional time now. Exactly. So, so exactly. if you if you designate a day or a part of a day for collaboration and all those things. Now you're cutting into even more instructional time. So the, the t just keep be mindful that that, that decision 
um, may be a good one uh, in a different time, but mm -hmm. you're going to be impacting students' instructional time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in any I decision, just keep that in the mind. Day, sir. Well, we would, yeah. and I, if I can just add to that, one thing to consider if we do yeah. add that kind of day, and we know some districts are considering that, we still have the daily engagement requirement. Mm -hmm. And it's right. not just the requirement that concerns us, we can build a schedule. We can build it. It's the concern that kids won't engage. If you imagine, and I'm not speaking for all 14 and 15 year olds, but if all, they have to, if all they're doing on a Friday is clicking in the Zoom so the school can get money, the level of attendance will probably shrink mm -hmm. because they don't have a motivation to attend the Zoom. So we'd have to be sure that we really strengthen the motivation for that kind of engagement. I think we can, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's a concern. So yeah. another, another issue, though, that really requires some planning yes. and, and some, uh, you know, a process. Yes, Kevin? I, I just want to say none of these are insurmountable. It's just the time it will take right. to, to figure it out. So if you guys are willing to spend that time, so are we, and we will figure it out. It's just you have to be willing to, to spend the time to do that. Mm -hmm. Ted, so, Ted, did I, you have some thoughts on the elementary transition? You know, I'm I'm thinking that I don't know about the other people, but I'm not thinking that we're we're talking about elementary. I think no, we're talking. I think elementary is fine in the AM PM. Yeah. Model. Okay, then I don't need to say anything. <laughs> so I was going to I was going to kind of stop you unless other people. Well, I, 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 no, I know I, she's. One thing I would share, just uh, thinking of building in that collaboration time with elementary. I know it centers around a lot of concern for parents is just that daycare situation. Mm. Yes. That if we do yeah. come back in some capacity and we're using a Wednesday collaboration day where teachers are off doing this, which I agree with Jim, we support it, we want those things to happen, but it does start creating some, some daycare situations for families yeah. and it's significant too. Yeah, I think the kid, with the little kids, it would, it would still be the, you know, the AM, PM. I mean, I, I, mm. I don't know, but Eileen, I'm sorry. I've been kind of <laughs> delaying you for a while there. No, that, that's quite all right. We were dealing with Tom's concerns led into a couple of other things. Um, and, and this is related uh, today. Um, from Associated Press, this was a release from the California um, State's um, Director of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mark Gailey, um, and he was indicating that they have been doing um, the inf uh, information gathering on whether or not the, let's see how many, in the state of California, they had... Um, 32 of the state's 58 counties had opened to in-person instruction because they were in tiers that would allow them to do that. And that after those counties opened to in-person instruction, they have, um, they've been looking at the information and so far they said they have noticed no increase in transmission rates or problems at the schools that have opened. I saw that report as well, and while that is very encouraging, um, we have to look at how long those schools have been open. Uh, the American Pediatric Association recently released a survey saying that since April, the number of COVID cases uh, that have been attributed to kids have risen from 2% of all cases in children and school-age children up to 10%. I don't think we can pretend that COVID is not a concern for kids. I know a lot of, not no one in this room particularly, but I know there's a lot of talk, especially on social media, that kids can't get it and kids can't spread it. And I think we need to acknowledge that's not the case. Um, and for all those students who are chomping at the bit to return, and I know there are many of them and I feel for them, we also have students who have uh, immune issues or who have family members with immune issues who are deathly afraid of having to come back and who also don't want the ingenuity as a platform. I think there's a reasonable concern. Um, I will be asking, if not right now at some point, for us to, uh, not, to consider not opening until November 2nd to give staff time to A, watch the numbers from Butte County to see if they rise again after the closure of the testing site, and also to make sure we have plans nailed down for this third way. I know it's been indicated that we are ready to go. Um, if we are really going to put in place a third way in which we somehow offer site-based online learning to students 
as well as opening in the AMPM model, I want to have that nailed down before I vote to reopen. So I, I would look to you guys for perhaps two more weeks of time to make sure we know what we're doing before we do it. Okay, um, I think um, I've already spoken to uh, Mr. Vincent about how that could possibly work um, as far as the technology and, uh, yeah. Mr. Moretti has his hand up. Oh, I, okay, um, okay, well, yeah. Kevin, do you want to go first then? Well, I just wanted to comment on something prior. I know you guys aren't looking at, at uh, elementary for an A day, B day, but just to make this more complicated, when I surveyed my elementary members, I did put the A day, B day on there. And I got a lot of feedback from many members. I couldn't tell you how many saying, why didn't I get to vote on that? So there's interest there too. <laughs> So good luck. Well, I think the, yeah, just a second. I think though that the, I don't know, the AM, AM, PM for the kids seems like a more natural fit. And I think after, after having spoken to Mr. Vincent about what the possibilities are as far as having the third option, it would seem to make a lot of sense. Um, I'm just comparing it because I am spending every day in this process with an elementary school student, and it is working out really well. And I'm just thinking, how would that work if I did want you know, the, my grandson to stay at home with me and not expose him to school? What would that look like? And um, Mr. Vincent was kind of telling me what that might look like. So yes. maybe you could share that. <laughs> you bet. So, um, so we're very fortunate in that we have a very good relationship with ViewSonic. And so because of that, we were able to get 350 of these TVs right here. And also we were able to get 800 of those webcams that are up on top. And so utilizing those TVs, the webcams, and the computers that are in all of our staff members' rooms, that gives them a good platform to be able to utilize that to do Zoom meetings while they're teaching a class. So if there's a class in place and there's kids at home, they can utilize the camera with their desktop machine to show the teacher and they could be writing on the on the whiteboard that's on the ViewSonic, and that would show up also then on the, on the screens for the kids that are at home. So it gives a really nice platform for those teachers to to give a really engaging uh, interface for those kids. And I, and I think you mentioned too another uh, benefit was that it, it somehow helped the um, transmission of the Zoom or yes, or, or the ViewSonic or so <laughs> something like that. So we had and we saw this at an earlier board meeting. We had it was ViewSonic that was trying to manage the Zoom meetings. And the, and the ViewSonic by itself trying to do everything was brought to its knees. So by having two PCs in the classroom, now the PC, the, the desktop machine, can manage the Zoom, it can do the recording, it can do all the things that it needs to do, and that takes a lot of processing power. And then split that load then with the ViewSonic to do the screen share. So between those two machines, it actually makes a very smooth, um, a smooth presentation. Thank you, John. Kathy? Yeah, so I feel like, uh, we're uh, jumping around and I would like us to get back on the context of a decision that we might be making. Um, and that is that we were in, in three, we're discussion action and the, uh, the issue was return to in-person instruction. Now, I believe the third rail or framework of reference um, it's been alluded to, but what I believe we've been talking about is uh, the school would be in an AM, PM model, the teacher would be teaching, and if there were children for whom either personal health or family health, because we've seen a lot of comments in that context, very real, they could be watching their teacher and their classmates on Zoom and with the new screen that you've got set up. So to me, that is a, a, a viable third model. I believe we would need to vote first on AM, PM uh, and opening and then have that be included. Or do we, can we just do it all together? Because we hadn't really had a lot of sophistication about this, but it's, it seems like it's really matured. In the last. At the end of our presentation, the, one of the slides I believe is, is the next, is the action steps. And um, we still have some slides to get through to get to, get to that. I just want to, uh, we did work on some language to try to better define this third option because it can just be bouncing all over. So a sentence we came up with just to start the conversation 
is in-person lessons will be transmitted in real time via Zoom and or other district approved platforms accessible by students enrolled in the class with the following expectation in place, that there be written communication uh, to be delivered to parents of online learners describing the reduction in engagement opportunities. So if you picture a teacher trying to manage the 19, let's say it's 50%, 19 kids in his or her room and manage chat and manage hands being raised, that's very difficult for a teacher to do. However, there is a district in the Bay Area that is doing this and they've, um, they've agreed that the last five minutes of each class, the teacher addresses anything that's in the chat or any raised hands by the online learners. So there is some language that we've started with and we think we can, we can flesh that out. So we should go back to the- So let's, um, let's, let's, okay, let, let's, Tina, I think you were gonna go through these. And let's just go through these and then let's, but I think there's a couple of questions that have to be answered and that we've been delving into. And, and I think it is appropriate that we do do that because okay. we, we have a lot of concern. We have concern from all different kinds of arenas and we do need to discuss these things. So, um, but let's go through Tina's and then we'll come to the question that John referred to. I just wanna let you know that Tina's done a masterful job getting this ready. And again, she spent the last few weeks developing a, a workday child supervision for an AMPM model, and um, that would probably need to change. I don't know if Tina is that? Yeah, we're flexible. Uh, Tina, yes, don't you worry, have been. Flexible. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> as Jim alluded to a little bit earlier, we have had the workday child supervision going on since August 17th when school started. We've served 260 kids of Chico Unified employees in the model that we have and um, have welcomed on, uh, as Ritesh Kanji mentioned earlier, at this point I believe 45 foster youth, homeless and at risk students with capacity for more. Uh, we also, uh, moving forward, because this is a big concern to families, we, you know, those of us that have raised kids and worked, we all can certainly understand this. We are looking at a different way to um, shift things around for the smoothest transition for kids to be at their school site and then also have supervision at that site, which would enable families to be able to continue their work day pretty seamlessly without having to um, manage movement and change for them and their kids. Uh, Jim said it earlier, and I can't uh, speak highly enough of CARD. They have been as flexible with this uh, situation as I could possibly dream they could be. And uh, it's kind of an adventure we're on, but we are flexible to shifting and moving. I do believe we can, we can adapt to anything to help our families where we're at. It would be about 502 children currently with CARDs, kids that are paid right now, ours and our at-risk population. So, so this was designed obviously for the AMPM. So that's another reason, especially for elementary school, that that, because that's who's gonna be needing the care more so, correct? We shifted it to, to work for AMPM, yes. And, and ha, do, are there children that are in um, middle school that well, go to that? There are. Keep in mind, you have high school teachers that have elementary age kids. So if they're in a different work schedule, uh, it, it doesn't coincide. So daycare will not match up. Okay, see that's, that's the other thing is we, we worked these things out in our minds back in July, right, right. and now we have to refresh ourselves on sure. all the reasons why. There's a lot why. of moving parts that are intertwined. Right, exactly. One thing that we need to consider on that too, if we have one uh, secondary at an AB schedule and elementary is a AM PM, a lot of families use their older siblings, their junior high and their high school siblings to watch their, their the younger siblings. So they would not be on the same schedule in order to do that. Also, my phone's been blowing up from teachers that are telling me on text message, we didn't know that we were supposed to be writing emails to support AMPM because we thought that was the model we were going into. I think Ms. Moretti, Mr. Moretti said that very nicely earlier. It's split down with his things and he, we would have to go back out most likely and I don't want to speak for Ms. Moretti again that he most likely would have to survey his staff again but I think he's true that it would be split on pretty close to either side. Again, teachers are saying we didn't know that we should be trying to support a &P because we thought that we were already going to that. I'm gonna just jump in here for a moment and just um, encourage the board to 
make sure we listen to, I know we have some staff members that want to speak on both probably A and PM and AB. So let's make sure we give them a time before we get too far down headed where we want to go. And we also should hear from parents as well. There uh, may be advantages to AB to parents. There may be advantages to A and PM, but let's make sure we hear from them as well. Okay, so we'll let uh, Tina finish up hers. And then, um, you know, as we said originally, we want to listen to what staff has to present, and then we'll entertain uh, comments from other people. Yeah, so I, I can finish up my section here before uh, John and Ted take over in, in saying that we are adaptable to help support teachers with their um, children and also in conjunction with those folks that have been with CARD since the beginning and are at risk population. So this is a sample without times in because we're negotiating those, but it'll be roughly speaking, you know, a little bit less than half a day because there'll be some need to be some change over time where, you know, group A would be leaving, group B is not there yet so the classes can be cleaned, sterilized, um, and then as, as that process finishes, it would, the group B would be coming in. So it's, it's a little bit vague because we haven't really fleshed out the exact times yet, but this was built around an AM, PM schedule with those kinds of things. Um, with a lunch break or you know lunch coming in for the P, I'm sure I can't talk right now, I'm sorry. It was designed so that we could be serving breakfast to the AM group on site, and it was designed so we could serve lunch to the PM group coming on site that way also, but also so that when the AM group was leaving, they would be leaving with a lunch. So they could be eating lunch at home, and then conversely, the PM group, when they were leaving, they would be leaving with a breakfast. So they could be eating breakfast at home before they came to school. So we wanna make sure kids are fed when they come to school. We also make sure they have time to eat on campus. Um, and certainly build in some time for cleaning to kind of sanitize those areas and make sure that they're ready for the next group to come in as well. So it's intentionally vague without times, but that was a design of it to kind of see what happens tomorrow at negotiations as far as what the length of the day would look like. But it'd be roughly half a day minus an hour plus for kind of cleaning in there someplace. Okay, and here is a draft secondary schedule with times removed. We still have some things to work on there. Um, it is rather busy just because we wanted to portray a student day and also a teacher day. We know it's important for teachers to see, okay, when would I be teaching what? So the colors are related to the teacher perception, and then you can see the, uh, the, the student day. So basically we have, we have split our schools into quarters, and we have students moving through either in the morning every other day or in the afternoon every other day. And similarly to elementary, the same lunch or, um, meal programs would be offered. We are also looking at providing the same snack to the after school program students. So we wanna be sure that they're taken care of as well. So this isn't the only thing that's changed here since the summer is the times, just because those are still conversations we need to have. Any questions about this? I know it's, it's a busy graphic because we tried to layer on the different perspectives. And this is just one week. So the second week of this would be um, the opposite periods for the students each Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Any questions? <laughs> Eileen? <laughs> Took me a minute there. <laughs> uh, do they, in the second week, uh, what, I guess my question is, do they wait a week before they repeat a class? No, they, so in the first week, let's say I was, in, I was a student in integrated math one, I would see that teacher three times the first week and two times the second week. Oh, okay, yeah, got so it. Yeah, so five times okay. over two weeks. So this slide was a little, um, some of the steps we'd need to be taking to move forward if the will of the board was to kind of determine the model tonight and put a starting date in place. We've certainly been talking with that Monday teacher group, which is one of the, the first things. Principal groups have been starting to have some conversations, kind of one of those what if conversations, or what do we need to start thinking about and planning towards in this area. Uh, the third bullet down really talks about if we were moving and the will of the board was to come back on the 19th or whatever day, we would want to kind of build in some time to give teachers some prep time, planning time, organization time. 
and do something to the effect of do a quick check-in with students, let them know what's happening, let them kind of visit their class to see what they're gonna be coming to, but then do a short Zoom, let those teachers check out at that point and really get ready for the return of students at that point and take a day or two, depending on what we come out with at negotiations for that also. But, but we know, you know teachers haven't been in their class with kids for about eight months now, so they are definitely chomping at the bit to have some time to get ready for that. We wanna try to build in some time to make that happen for them as well. Um, on those two days, elementary, we have a couple questions about what some of that asynchronous time might be. If they're in class a little bit shorter, they might have a little bit more of a homework component to have to be doing. We want to take some time to talk about that and plan accordingly for those things. Um, secondary, I'm certain we'll have some other issues that they want to be talking about as well. So we want to build in some time for those conversations and certainly talking with district leadership council about you know, what's going to be happening, how we're going to implement it, and kind of moving forward from there with it. Could you be a little clearer? Uh, in the in the framework of days so if we uh vote to start on the 19th what we, day date sure. would these teachers have these 10 minute warning check-ins we, thursday and friday yeah thursday and friday before okay. Kathy's like the 15th and okay. 16th so if okay. we if that was the will of the board the 19th okay. we've intentionally started talking saying we need to have a couple days it would be the thursday friday before so, like that so that would mean i mean because i have Right. I have one too, you know. <laughs> that, that would mean that he, he wouldn't be doing his schooling Thursday and Friday. We would have, a, like I said, a kind of a teacher check-in time, really yeah. kind of introducing them to the class. You're going to yeah. be coming here, yeah. walking through some of the expectations for okay. being in class, kind of a little prep time via Zoom so that when they do show up on, that, on the Monday after, they've had a little bit of exposure to the class and kind of the expectations and the guidelines they're coming back to but certainly with the um, desire to give teachers some time to be getting ready for them to be coming in person also. Okay, so that teacher then would use uh, the rest of the morning or the afternoon to actually get ready and, and yep. not be mm -hmm. thrust into it. Exactly. Okay, thank you. By the way, you haven't met the five-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if we can click on this. This is the uh, Butte County Public Health Department guidance. So they've developed um, a scenario sheets um, for us to follow. Uh, this is also on our website, um, our district website. But so every scenario, they have it when we go through it. I believe that there is, sorry, if you can see them, if a student or staff member, the first one um, either exhibits symptoms, answers yes to a health screening question or a temp check at 100.4, the action then again would be student and staff sent home, contact um, health care provider uh, for testing. All right, then no action needed. We wouldn't at that time need to, to stop school. So they have developed scenarios for each type of situation that can come up. I know that a lot of that, a lot of questions have come in emails of different situations. They have guided us through what we would need to do um, when it comes to which scenario um, we would have to follow. I don't know if there's any, I know that I think you guys have seen this form before or not, but um, that is available for people to see in the public. Next steps. Okay, um, communicate reopening of school model and conditions with the families. This is after you guys take action tonight. Families register for instructional models. Again, we will be asking them, and as Mr. Lando said, we might want to ask them again if we come with an option where the kids can be on their own campus um, Zooming which we believe that we can make that happen tomorrow. Um, planning for staffing adjustment begins. That's at Thursday, Friday. We'll be doing some other stuff way, um, this next week, or actually Friday with DLC. We have an all DLC Friday afternoon and we'll be talking to them after we get direction from the board and after we have negotiations on Thursday, we will be meeting with DLC to what they think that we're going to need to go over what model and what date that we are planning on going to. Um, fine tune each instructional model and begin implementing safety guidelines. Again, we will want to make sure that all our guidelines are in place, as Mr. Boltman says, um, we'll have them in place and we believe that they will be by next week. And our principals are waiting again what we, after tonight, to try to possibly put different mo videos available to put out online what possibly the inter of the, of the campuses would look like and those types of things. Um, initiate professional development for staff. And after we figure out, too, we want to be able to, and we'll talk this in negotiations tomorrow, our kindergarten garden parents, we want to give them a day. I don't know if it'll be that Friday, bef you know, bef before we decide that model so the parents can walk their kids to the actual classroom because that's always been a big thing in the past. 
or if we're going to start kindergartner a little later that day so they can know everybody else is in class so those people can walk onto our campus with their kids so that first time to go through the gates because we really don't want our families to, that first day to say, well, can't go past the gate, it's around the corner or whatever, that kind of thing, or here's your teacher here for the first time that they're seeing them. So we would like to be able to provide some type of day for kindergarten. Okay, at, at this time, I guess we will be opening up the public. I believe, I know at one point we had 11, I don't know what we're up to. Before we do that, may I just ask a couple random questions that sure. have come up? Linda, go ahead. Linda, are you there? According to Mr. Vincent, she is unmuted. There she is. Can you there. hear us, Linda? Hi. Oh, there you okay, go. good. We got you back. <laughs> oh, sorry. Unstable internet, apparently. I think my husband's watching the debates. I don't know. Um, so face masks, will we have face masks available for our students or face shields? Uh, yes, we have both in stock. Uh, and okay. we have a local supplier that can get them to us in, in just days. So we have, we have enough Excellent. to provide. Excellent. The other question was probably on the uh, Butte County Health Department sheet that Jay showed us towards the end of this mm -hmm. presentation, but I, I hate to even ask this question. I don't want to put it out there, but I think it's important. If we do have a case of COVID, who does the contact tracing? Is that all on Butte County Health Department to take care of that on our behalf? My understanding is if we go to AMPM, we have to do that. They do not provide contract contact tracing. So I probably okay. would follow our nurses. Okay, very good. All right, the other question I'll ask later when we come down to uh, taking a vote. So thank you. Yeah, so Ms. Hubby, on the, the when it, sorry, when it comes to the mask, we are going to be encouraging our families to have have masks for their children, but we will have them sure. available if they do forget, forget them for that day. Um, okay. Again, having 12,000, nearly 12,000 students. That's a lot of masks every day, every which day. is why I was asking. Correct. So. All right, very good. Let's hear from the public. Okay, so the way we're gonna do this is the way I explained at the very beginning. We're gonna take the first three people and then we're going to determine how much time we wanna spend with this. If it's further, I think we've covered a lot of things ourselves because we've referenced a lot of the letters that we've been receiving. Um, so uh, I would hope we'd be able to get a good representation of different viewpoints and not just the same viewpoint because if we keep hearing people saying the same thing over and over again, you know, I'd like to find some way to determine getting you know, the other perspective if there's other people out there. Yeah, um, Tom, go ahead. On that note, um, I'd want to get a clarification on the rules. Did we have a rule in the public input talking about uh, emphasizing uh, getting new speakers before having the same speaker twice? We, yes, exactly, I did, we did, Just it's wait, in there. I, I thought that was in there, thank you. Because um, who are our speakers for this next segment? So the first three are Andrea Campos, Tanner Johns, and Eva, Eva Horvath, those are the first three. Okay, okay, okay. yes, Kathy. I uh, also thought though, we made it really clear, and I thought you said this at the beginning, that the people who had submitted speaker cards as we had stated. So we have, I thought, 11 of those, or have we already gone through some of them? We now have 21. Okay, there's no way that we can do that. That would put us here all night. It's already eight o'clock. They each get three minutes, you have to call them. So I, I want, we had originally said 11, and I think we just have to go with the ones who initially submitted the speaker cards, and I really appreciate you, Tom, that if somebody has already made a comment, then I, I think we should defer to someone who hasn't. So we are hearing different viewpoints. So of the people that you have for the 11 cards that were originally submitted, are those any um, duplicates of people who've already spoken? Yes, and Erica's amazing, she's already highlighted the the person who has already spoken. 
Okay, so we're gonna listen to people who haven't already spoken. We'll take those. And um, yes, Tom? I was gonna try and formalize that. Can we just hear from 11 speakers we haven't heard from yet? Can we, can we make a motion on exactly that? <laughs> okay. Is that a rule? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, right. well, we're, <laughs> yeah. All right, so, uh, okay. If, if I mean, if you wanna vote on that, we can vote on it. So um, uh, a motion has been made that we will hear this, the 11 speakers. Those will not be people who have already spoken, and they will be held to their three-minute time limit. Um, that was, uh, Tom proposed that. It was seconded by Kathy. Uh, Linda, how, how say you? Do you in favor, are you in favor of that? <laughs> Linda, you're going to have to unmute. <laughs> you need to unmute. <laughs> unmute. Unmute. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> you had great fa I, facial expressions, but we didn't really understand what you were saying. <laughs> great speech with or without words. Well, I'm on my mind. Um, I, I'm going to vote no on that. I think I need to hear a little more than 11. Um, maybe not 22, maybe meet somewhere in the middle. I think the public really needs to give us their feelings. So I'll vote no. Okay, Tom. Well, I kind of like this motion. I'm going to vote aye. I like it. Aye. 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 aye uh, because of the significant number of inputs through email and other communications that we've already received. Yeah, I think we've already discussed a good number of things. Um, okay, so we'll get started. Okay, just for clarification before I start, I have no way of knowing if they're pro or con. Right. And I know that was a conversation before. I just want to be sure that the board understands. I'm. No. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, I know, um, I guess this is really difficult to determine. I was thinking about this earlier today that it would be very difficult. Um, uh, Well, I guess I guess that's true. Yeah. Just go with it. Okay, we're just going to go with it. Okay. Okay. I'm starting with Andrea Campos. Okay. automatic voice message system. Shall I call again? Thank you. Tanner Johns, I'll be calling you next. Hi, Tanner, it's John Shepard. I'm going to put you on speaker. Just hold on a sec. Okay, Tanner, you are addressing the Cheaper Unified School Board. Hi, good evening, and thanks for taking my call. Uh, my name is Tanner Johns. I'm a music teacher for Chico Unified School District at Bidwell Junior High School. And I'm just going to read portions of a letter that I wrote and sent to all of you this afternoon um, with some concerns that I, I know I have and many other teachers have as well. So I'm just going to jump in here. Um, so far, my family has mercifully been spared by this awful disease that um, yet does not mean that we have not made sacrifices. I have a wife and two beautiful and brilliant daughters, ages four and two, and we have sacrificed family visits. We've sacrificed vacations. We have missed birthday parties and summer backyard barbecues with friends. We've given up play dates and trips and trips to the store in the park. We've put swim lessons on hold and ballet classes on hold. And my wife and I continue to juggle working, working from home and taking care of our kids. Um, the person, you know, there are sacrifices that we have been making to make this happen. The personal and professional balancing act is, is challenging. Um, so is teaching and learning through a screen. There are barriers between teacher and student that make personal connection extremely difficult. And there are times when technology, internet speeds, and user error make daily Zoom classes hard. Online platform, learning platforms lack the personal care and encouragement those most at risk need in order to help find consistent success and I worry about the students being left behind. And I absolutely yearn for the days of in-person instruction and to be around people making music again uh, as a music teacher. 
Um, yet in we recent weeks, I've begun to see some true successes in my students through the online learning, and I know I'm not doing ingenuity like many others, but make no mistake that some, while distance learning is harder, slower, and impersonal, um, there is learning occurring. The decision of CUSD to bring students back to school is nuanced and requires a lot of planning. I think we've heard tonight that there's a lot of evidence that you all have been working really hard to make that happen, and, and I want to let you know that we appreciate those, those efforts. On some level, it's really exciting, but there is no doubt that in-person instruction um, will help our children be more successful. As a teacher, it's vastly more, more rewarding to work that way. Hopefully, in-person instruction can begin the healing process this awful virus has necessitated. It is no secret that this forced isolation is having detrimental effects on our students' mental health. But the decision to return uh, kids to our schools is being rushed. Um, we have all worked so hard and given up so much as a community and county to reduce our infection rates. I can't help but ponder all the sacrifices my family has made and how in just a couple of short weeks I'll be exposing myself and my family to hundreds of contacts every day. What has been the point of our sacrifice? Every time I open my email, there is a new information about reopening or a new survey to take. And those surveys are flawed. They often give you two answers. One is, yes, I would, I'm willing to come back, or I have concerns, and all of a sudden I'm put into a pool of people who's maybe potentially teaching at Oak, Oak Ridge. Um, I'm sorry, Tanner. Tanner, teachers. Tanner, I'm sorry. Your, your time has elapsed, but we appreciate your calling in. Thank you. I will add that Tanner wrote an email that has um, a letter attached to it. Yeah, it so does, and it explains further. Too. I mean, there's no way possible he could have said everything he wanted to say, I know, and I, I read the letter, so I recommend you all do. Yeah, Eileen, yeah, we all did. Okay, I'm calling Eva Horvath. Yeah, perfect. Hello, Eva. This is John Shepard. I'm going to put you on hold for a second, and I'll let you know when to start, okay? Okay, you are addressing the Chico Unified School District Board. Uh, my name is Eva Horvath, and I'm an educator at ASC Cal and Fairview High School. First, I do want to acknowledge all of the hard work that has gone in from everybody. I see the stress on my colleague's face. I see the stress on my administrator's face. Everybody is working so hard to make this work or try to work, I guess. But I think it is incredibly short-sighted and dangerous to entertain the idea of reopening schools. It is impossible to guarantee the safety of my students, their families, or myself. And that can barely even be guaranteed now with educators who currently are on campuses who do not practice social distancing, do not wear masks, or, any, or practice any other form of safety precaution. On my campus, we don't even have hot water for our students to wash their hands or a health aid. I'm wondering why cohorts that will address individual needs of students who are high risk and the, great, at the greatest need would be abandoned. Cohorts will leave plenty of time for cleaning and disinfecting. As it stands now, there will not be disinfecting happening between a.m. and p.m. in secondary classes unless the teacher chooses to do so. I wonder how my colleagues at the elementary school level will perform the wizardry of potentially teaching both in person and online simultaneously. And I'm wondering how any of us will be expected to effectively assist a student with online learning curriculums that we didn't write and don't control while they sit six feet away from us in our classroom. I'm wondering why all of a sudden we are willing to risk the safety of so many based on skewed test results. And I wonder why we're deeming it safe to send kids back into the classroom with the knowledge that when numbers go back up, we will be asked to stay within those four walls that we usually find so much comfort in. Of course, educators, educators want to be back in the classroom. The students of this community are my life's work. I began my career here when I was 21 years old, and I can attribute every single gray hair on my head to worrying about these kiddos in my classroom. To ask me to even consider putting them and their families in danger is an affront to the craft that I have dedicated myself to. 
I want to thank you so much for hearing me with open minds and understanding that the passion that I speak with is for the precious lives in my classroom. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Next caller, please. Okay, I'm calling Ellie Ertl. Ellie Ertl. Hello, is this Ellie? Ellie, this is John Shepherd from the TPSI School District Board Meeting. I'm gonna put you on hold and then I'll, I'll let you know when you can start, okay? Okay, Ellie, you are addressing the Chico Unified School District Board. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you tonight. I know that you have a difficult decision in front of you and weighing the many diverse needs in Chico Unified School District is complex. I also know you have begun to address what I'm here to ask you, but I'd like to add my perspective. I'm here tonight as a community member and a parent of two children at Chico High School. I am one of the many people who did not fill out the survey as presented due to the fact that it provided me two choices. One, to send my children back to school face to face, or two, to send my children to Oak Ridge. I find both of these choices impossible and unfair. Despite my deep concerns about reopening schools in this early rushed manner, I am not here to ask you to not reopen schools. I won't try and convince anyone that the science is not in support of going back, although it is not. I am here to ask you to please realize the harm that you are doing in providing only two options for families at this time. My children and many others like them are faced with the decision. Return to in-person school when it's clearly not safe to do so or leave their beloved school, drop all of their classes and start with new classes at a new school halfway through their semester. This is heartbreaking and unfair. My senior in high school, for example, would lose both of her electives, one of which is giving her college credit and her AP classes, which are not offered in Oak Ridge severely impacting her ability to get into the college of her choice. She has been working hard all four years of high school and maintaining A's even in these challenging times because she has a dream to go to a particular college. If she's forced to move to, move to Oak Ridge this semester, her plans are torn apart. For her and for all of the students like her who can't return to school right now and the risk is still high, come up with a third option. Let students continue with school the way they've been doing it. Don't upend their lives in mid-October as you ride headlong into a half-stake return to in-person schooling. I know many people who want and need this option, but you won't see it reflected in your survey results because we didn't know how to respond to binary options, or we didn't see the email, or we didn't want to pull our kids out of their schools and disrupt their lives even more, and we were told it was a commitment. So we felt forced to say, yes, we'll come back. You asked families, return to in-person or go to a bridge. Unfortunately, this was a Sophie's choice, an impossible decision that requires many families to choose between their health and their children's dreams. I know many of you personally, and I know you care about our students, teachers, staff, and community. So do the right thing, figure out a third option. It is possible with creativity and technology, as Mr. Vincent explained, it is possible. I'm heartened by your plans to negotiate a third option and Mr. Vincent's excellent explanation of the possibility. I applaud your ingenuity, see what I did there, and work to support all students equitably, and I call on the board and the union to find a way to make that happen. Thank you. Okay, our next caller is Sue Peterson. Sue Peterson. Hi, Sue. This is John Shepard from Chico Unified. I'm going to put you on hold, and then I'll let you know when to start, okay? Okay, go ahead, Sue, you're addressing the school board. Okay, hi, my name is Sue Peterson and I have a student at Bidwell Junior High School and is a sixth grader this year. And originally I put my name in to call in to ask for a third option for students to be able to attend school online because my daughter has an immune condition. And um, we started out at Oak Bridge this year. We had a wonderful teacher who we loved but unfortunately, we only got to talk to that teacher once a week for about 20 minutes. And my daughter was really feeling isolated and struggling in that setting. So we switched back to Bidwell, which is our home school. And the last two weeks since we've been there have been wonderful. And so I was calling to ask for an on-site choice of um, virtual learning for the students who do not have 
the privilege of having the health to be able to take the risk to go back. I think Shasta County demonstrates the risk that we're taking to send our, ba our kids back to school right now. There's 13 schools with infections in Shasta County, and for my daughter, that's a risk that we can't really take. Um, but I, since listening tonight, I really feel like I need to voice my concern about sending anyone back to the classroom where a teacher has to be, um, like the teacher who spoke earlier, and they don't have the choice to make that stay-at-home decision that we do unless they switch out of the classes that they love. They might be teaching things that aren't available at Oak Bridge, and at Oak Bridge, they're only going to be able to talk to students on a very limited basis. So I really changed my opinion, and I hope that you will take the option of at least waiting until the November 2nd date to see what happens with our cases after holidays like Halloween happen and after we have opened up and ex uh, um, exposed people to a lot more cases, I think it's only fair to our teaching staff, our teaching faculty in the district that we allow that to happen before we send them back to a classroom with children who might be exposed at home um, and exposing them to take that disease home to their families. So I urge you to wait until at least that November 2nd date and maybe even past the holidays when people are gathering. Thank you for listening to me and I hope that you can make a decision that protects both the students and the teachers who are working in Chico Unified. Okay, before we, before we move forward, um, I neglected to do something which I had uh, arranged before, and that is um, Gina Snyder, who is the person who created the uh, explanation for the AB schedule and has been, um, tr you know, kind of uh, vetting that and, um, and promoting that, um, I had explained that she could she could speak and she was going to uh, I was going to call upon her when that came up but I forgot to do it so uh, she's been waiting and I'm going to allow her Gina I'm very sorry um, having gotten caught up with the discussion with um, the people who are here um, I failed to recall that so um, uh, but I, I am only going to be allowed to give you the three minutes. So we, we did discuss it to some extent here. So if you'd like to hit upon maybe some of the things we may not know, um, that would be great. So um, if you would, Gina. I, is she, I will call her. I don't believe um, she uh, uh, Oh, yeah. I have, I have her phone number here, oh. and be, she is within the the people we were already going to call. So she was with, within that number. Oh, she was. Okay, yeah. well, so we if would, you could get her now, I just I want her to, yeah, I just want her to be able, because she was concerned we weren't going to get to her at all. Just hold for a second and I will let you know when you can go. Okay, Gina, you're addressing the Chico Unified School District Board. Okay. I think I should mute my computer. And Gina, just so you know, um, if you could speak slowly and um, more closely to your microphone, that would be great. Okay, is this okay? Can you hear me okay right like this? Yes, that's that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, because they kind of get feedback, so I'm trying to mute my computer to help. Okay. Oh, three minutes, but speak slowly. You're funny. Um, okay. Well, there's a lot of discussion going on here, and I think it can be super productive. Um, I appreciate that you looked at that AP schedule, and for people who really aren't hearing the bigger picture, I'd like an opportunity to explain what I propose, especially parents at home. And there's some nuances here that I think are not insurmountable, like was uh, said in the past. But a, a, a basic form of an A day, B day is the idea that kids go to all their, I don't have a fancy like schedule up there like you saw earlier, but half the school will go to all their classes all day. The other half are at home. Then that switches. The next day, the other half of the school 
comes to school all day for all their classes and the other half then are now at home. So it's just this back and forth, okay? It's not a terribly hard concept, however. Um, in making this document, it was really in the spirit of <clears throat> compromise. And in this compromise notion, um, the idea here was um, to take in all these stakeholders. And I feel like AB model gives people an opportunity, more of an opportunity. <clears throat> um, and, and I think what the board has done now, and, and not the board, I'm sorry, the district has done is kind of cherry pick some of the ideas out of here, which is fine. And I might even say, maybe I'm a little flattered, but before we go on to what their third option is and how that is being presented to you, I think we need to know a few other things. Um, first of all, um, there are some amazing benefits to an A day, B day schedule. First of all, if you hearken back to kindergarten, when you're dropping off your kid and picking them up three hours, well, now we're doing that twice within the day, right? You're dropping off and picking up, and then you're dropping off and picking up. Our community will be inundated with dropping off and picking up. I couldn't wait for kindergarten to get over. So now we're asking, you know, these families to do that. If you just look at book pickup, it was a challenge for students and parents and grandparents to make it to the school to pick up books um, at, at between 12 and 2 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. So I'm just saying, you know, that, that kind of hectic drop-off pickup is not an ideal situation for families in our community. And additionally, the main benefit, one of the main benefits is of, of an A day, B day is we only have half the kids on campus at any given time, whereas in an a.m. p.m., you have 100% of the students on campus. Half in the morning, half in the afternoon equals 100%, right? But in an A day, B day, you only have half of them um, all day. So, but one of the main elements, too, that um, I think the district picked up on and liked and is using for their third way or whatever you want to call it, um, the, their third option is one of the big benefits of A day, B day that AM, PM will not allow. In a rotating AM, PM, you cannot Zoom with students at home while you are teaching. It's not possible. And the benefit of Zooming with your students who are at home is to keep curriculum moving forward at a pre-COVID pace, like on a daily pace. Okay, Gina, However, Gina, 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 I'm going to... Gina, I'm sorry, but I, I do have to stop you because we committed to, to having X number of speakers, and I know you covered this very thoroughly in, in your email, but um, what we are also discussing, in, in, and I think further we still need to discuss, is the possibility that this will be considered at some point. So I'm going to have to move on to the other speakers. Um, but I will, as I, as I uh, mentioned with, uh, with Tanner, um, ask that people read your email carefully so they know uh, what, what you haven't been able to express in this brief time. So thank you for that, and uh, we will have to move on to our next speaker. Okay, our next speaker is Brian Teal. Hi, Brian. I'm going to put you on hold, and then you'll be addressing the, the, the school board. Okay, hold on a sec. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Okay, thank you, board members, for allowing me to address the board. Um, a quick background about myself. I have a daughter who graduated two years ago from Chico High. I currently have a daughter who is a sophomore in the special education program at TV High. Um, I have a ma master's degree myself in biological psychology and specialize in research and presented my own research. I'm a moderate politically and aim to be as nonpartisan as possible. But since my daughter has health conditions related to her having Down syndrome, which makes her up to 10 times more likely to die from COVID, I have done vast amounts of research in uh, the peer reviewed journals and unbiased sources. So I'm worried about the potential outcomes of reopening schools and that we are 
the most opportune time to be reopening these schools. I passionately want schools to reopen for in-person learning, but not at this point. So what would be the best way to reopen? Maybe to continue with the current or remote uh, learning model through the end of January, through the winter break, uh, along with providing specific education to parents uh, on the mandates of effective coronavirus management, that of mask usage, social distancing, quarantine, social tracing, and access to testing, which is reduced right now. Um, complete additional research on hybrid models of learning as they aren't seen as much more effective at reducing COVID transmission than in-person full-time instruction. And the timing for reopening, uh, the best case, uh, if schools begin October 19th, we have five weeks for students hopefully in classrooms together, then taking Thanksgiving vacation where they will be attending family gatherings and additional intended exposures, well, mostly uh, asymptomatic if, if they're COVID positive. This can foster another significant increase in new cases in adults and the elderly who are more apt to be hospitalized and potentially die from the coronavirus. Uh, the same could be said for Christmas vacation. So there's a lot of vacation time coming up. Reopening towards the end of January would provide additional time to quarantine the new cases from holiday greetings and allow asymptomatic students to move through the infection without infecting others. Um, according to a study using 8,000 confirmed student cases in a typical classroom, a non masked class has a 91% chance of someone contracting the virus. If all students wear a basic mask, that's reduced to 23%. If all wear an N95 mask properly, it drops to 4%. And using HEPA filtration, it drops even more. But this is in class best case scenario. So California, as Tom mentioned, has the highest number of reported cases in coronavirus in the nation for 0 to 17-year-olds at 84,000, uh, which is 10% of all confirmed cases in the state. Uh, and the next case is uh, Florida at 41,000. So basically, um, you know, regarding special education, my understanding is that modified curriculum is not provided through Oak Ridge, which doesn't allow equal access to education for those students. So i just like to have them have access to that education uh, if they have any kind of health-related issues. And I strongly advise waiting until the end of January to reopen the schools. Uh, we have time to determine if holidays will bring around the second wave. Make sure all students and staff are negative for COVID-19. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Next caller, please. Okay, I'm calling Kimberly Snyder. Hello, Kimberly. I will put you on uh, hold for a second, and then you'll be addressing the school board, okay? Okay, go ahead, Kimberly. Okay. Hello, my name is Kimberly Snyder, a born and raised Chicoan. I have two kids, one in kindergarten and one in second. I have chosen to speak on this agenda, but want to quickly say that regardless of tier, I think we need to have the waiver passed in case the numbers do rise. I speak for a lot of parents and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, this is not working. My son, who is above grade level in kindergarten and first, is now falling behind. He is having behavioral issues that weren't present before. My kindergartner is doing well, but she is not getting the experience she deserves. My kids joined a CUSD pod for kids with bad internet Monday at a CUSD school. I heard a boy tell his sister to suck it. My kids told me there were kids cussing on their cell phones and allowed to watch the movie It. Needless to say, I pulled them out the second I heard that. I have a friend whose son says he would rather die than be on Zoom. He is depressed and not doing well. He is on the spectrum and not having the routine he was used to and the in-person support needed is causing anxiety. What about the fire victims that just went through a tragic event and want to have a normal life back? What about all the children that don't have any parental support? School is their only safe haven. Are they okay? Do you really know? It's been seven months since they've been in school where they feel safe and have comfort in knowing that at least they will get to eat that day or escape a toxic environment for a little while. These teachers are the protectors of these kids. Just the thought of what some of these kids are going through is absolutely heartbreaking. It cannot go on any longer. I'm not sure how many parents have said this, but I am not good. I am not okay. I am struggling more now than I ever have in my life. My mental health is not good, and it is affecting my family as well. I am supposed to love my job as a mom. I am not a teacher. The anxiety and stress are at an all-time high in every family I've spoken with. 
We spend the whole time while they're on Zoom redirecting them back to the screen over and over. We're doing the best we can and it isn't good enough. Please open up full time. But I'll settle now for AM PM with siblings in the same time so we parents can be get back to being a homemaker or better yet to work to help Chico's economy rise again and not crumble. The numbers we need to abide by to reopen are absolutely ridiculous and unreasonable. The parents, kids, and teachers have spoken loud and clear, and it's time to listen. Look into other counties, cities, and states. I have, and they are open and thriving. Why can we send kids to private schools full-time with no mask, pay for card, shop at Walmart, go to the gym, but not go to school, play sports, or worship with a full house? Things need to change, and it needs to be now. No, Tom Lando, we do not have time. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Okay, next caller, please. Okay, the next caller is Mark Owen. Voicemail. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Next one is Nili Udis. Nili? Correct. Nili Udis. I'm sure she'll correct me. Or he. Hi, Neely, this is John Shepard from Chico Unified. I'm going to put you on hold, and, you'll, and I'll let you know when you can address the board, okay? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, boy, I feel for the woman who just spoke, and I know that she represents lots of people who are struggling in this time. And I want to share that while I recognize that some are really struggling in this moment, I don't believe going back to school is the answer. Um, I don't believe that solves the problems that are representative of a pandemic that is affecting our entire nation and the world. I sent an email to all of you sharing my concerns for going back to school and opening up. I won't go through those again with you. Um, my hope is that you read that email. Um, but I do want to share and reiterate what is happening in Shasta County, our neighbor that did open up for schools and is now going into the red. I believe that happened today and is on par to move into the purple. There are many students and uh, staff that are ill. Um, I, I was one of those people who did not return the survey, who has not been represented because I don't feel that either of the options that we were given were uh, viable for my family. And this meeting tonight really does prove that that's true. There is not a clear consensus of what the children are even going back to. The teachers are split 50-50 on what they want to be doing. So how can we as parents say, yes, I'm going to agree to this model or this model? Um, for me, the pace is too fast. I agree that we should be waiting until we have a clear plan of how we're going to support our children. Um, I also feel for the woman who spoke and others that are struggling and recognize that you may need to make a decision to go back to school um, before my opinion feels like it's ready. And if that is the case, I urge you to consider that third option. Um, for us, we started two new schools this year. My youngest child is in second grade and started new at Hooker Oak. His teacher has worked so hard to help him build friendships with students online, and it would be detrimental for him to switch and move to Oak Ridge Model, where he loses all of that work that he's been doing for the last few months uh, building relationships. My older son in middle school is a student with an IEP. He receives three resource classes currently and occupational therapy. And without those services at Oak Ridge, I'm concerned for his ability to continue to move. He is currently getting A's in all of his classes, and my children are thriving. I recognize our experience is not everybody's, but I think you're hearing a little bit tonight that um, the loudest voices aren't always those that are um, wanting schools to reopen. We feel strongly, and there's lots of us who did not return the survey, who do not 
be are not able to be represented in what we have seen so far. And I just appreciate you all and recognize this almost impossible decision that you have to make. And I thank you for working hard for our families and for being heard. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, next caller, please. Okay, the next spe speaker is Duke. Hello, is this Duke? Hello, I'm, hello, I'm gonna put you on hold and I'll let you know when you can address the school board, okay? Okay, go ahead, Duke. First of all, thank you so much for doing this and for all your effort. A special thanks to all the teachers for the hard working. Uh, on behalf of many families of uh, district, uh, we are strongly support the third option for high school students. That is, some students still stay at their own schools with their own teachers, but they don't physically come to the school site. Instead, they take the same class online with their own teachers. For example, while well, a teacher is teaching a class in person, some students can be uh, synchronously with the class, but online. This way, the students will still take the class with the same teacher. It seems to me that Oak Bridge online choice is making some students change their teachers at the middle of the semester. Uh, some classes are not even offered at the Oak Bridge. Of course, the third choice details will be up to the schools and teachers. So the purpose of the third option, not only to reduce the risk for teachers, students, schools, and everyone, but also to increase the learning quality and the effectiveness. And by the way, this is being done uh, by many schools nationwide. Uh, as I know, some elementary schools have been doing surveys regarding this third option. Please also try to give this high school students third option. And, uh, and also after today's meeting, I even would like to say, let's wait. Waiting and watching, probably are better. Your understanding, serious consideration and support are deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, um, at this point, we've heard nine people there were two people we weren't able to get in touch with, and there was the additional person that um, had called or was put on the list earlier. So let's just give a quick call back to these okay. two people. Uh, first of all, let's let's take the person Tom had, who, who that person was from the very first segment okay. we had. Let's try that person first, and then maybe these last two who we couldn't get to. Okay, I'm now calling Lindsay Munn. Seven. Please leave a mm. Okay. As you can tell, voicemail. Okay, then let's let's just go back to um, Andrea, and then try uh, Mark Owen again, and then that'll be the end of this. Okay. Okay, and that would be more. Mark, Mark Owen. Owen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I know. Ms. Griffin, I yes. respectfully, I respectfully ask if we don't get a hold of Mr. Owen to perhaps um, get two more people that were on the list to speak. Um, I think the majority of the board is not in favor of doing that. We've already okay, voted well, on we that. We have 11, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I think we've um, reached our limit. Voicemail will get on that one. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to open this up to us to discuss because we do have to come to some decision here. Uh, as as uh, Kathy mentioned, uh, we've already been working on this for quite some time, and um, there is a limit to our productivity if we, you know, just keep spending a lot of time on something. We, we do need to just get focused and make a decision here. So, yeah, Kathy, then Tom. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look in that direction. All right. Eileen first, then Kathy, then Tom. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I, I understand, I think, the emotion and the judgment behind everybody's position. I think I've listened to and read those people that have reached out so eloquently. However, I don't think that they understand, those, those that are hesitant, understand the lengths to which this district has gone to make coming onto our campuses and into our classrooms safe. It, it, it's, it's almost like a hermetically sealed, you know, environment well beyond anything you're going to find in the community. And I understand for those that have not been out in the community who, who have, in fact, been at home for seven months, they may not feel that, that, that's, that that's the case. But for any of us that have gone into a grocery store, or to pick up packages, you know, we are going into situations that are not at all as, as rigorously planned for cleaning and planned for um, safety as, as what our, our uh, maintenance and operations department has and our, our cafeteria department as well have put into place. I, I just um, feel that we are in a very good, as, well, as good as you can get situation to bring kids safely back onto campus. And for those that just can't get through that barrier, like the s several families that spoke of significant health risks, I think that, um, are having the third option of being able to be in classes um, at the schools that what is your your home school is is going to help with some of those needs. I worry, just as everyone else does, about having led people to believe that we were going to be able to do this and then not do it now. And I don't think waiting another two weeks is at all going to be helpful. If you listen to Dr. Fauci and, and others at, at the national level, because of, of how even rolling out a vaccine isn't going to begin to provide protections well into next summer. And I'm sorry, but waiting to get our kids as safely as we can back into school with teachers for those that can is not okay. I want to get our kids back into school on October 19th with all of the things and all of the work and all of the planning that our teachers and our staffs 
have done. Um, I trust us. I trust us with our kids and our employees. And um, even though it's scary because this novel coronavirus is has a lot of unknown things that could happen to people that that have it and 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 get over it but may have lasting other health impacts from it i get it i get all that i am however in support of opening our schools on October 19th with the two days before to um, give teachers and kids a chance to make contact and prepare and make the um, adjustment to the health and safety protocols that we need to to let them know that the thermometer checks and things will be in the classroom or in the nurse's office and not at the front gate and um, that we have, we have, in fact, worked with the health department for contingencies. If we have an outbreak on one of our campuses, we'll handle it. Um, we have done an amazing amount of preparation, and I can't judge whether or not districts that are having problems just didn't do this kind of work. I don't know, but I trust us. I think, Kathy, you are next, and then Tom. Yeah. So uh, I uh, regret uh, at the time that we did the initial decision about A and PM, we hadn't actually third thought of the third option. And from the emails that I looked at and a number of the comments tonight, um, absolutely uh, families with 504s uh, in their children or issues and in, in their homes that third option I think offers them what most of them seem to be echoing I want the same teacher I want the same classmates I just want to be safe and that third option would allow them to maintain what they say for them is working and yet let other children have the actual physical experience of a classroom, uh, seeing a teacher that they can talk and hear to in uh, real time. And I do think that um, all of our staff, teachers and uh, uh, our other staff, have done an enormous amount of work uh, prepping for this. Uh, there is no perfect answer. Um, it's, it's not called a pandemic for any, any reason other than there is no perfect answer. Um, but I am strongly in favor of getting the children who are physically and emotionally capable back in school on the 19th in the AM, PM model. Uh, we have a kindergartner who's never gotten to go to kindergarten except on a computer. I have a second grader who fell far behind with the initial closing and is catching up, but it's taking one adult full time being with him while he's on the computer uh, for him to be able to pull that off. Um, so I, uh, I believe we can do this as safely as possible. It's not 100%, nothing is. Uh, and I think the third option, which many of our emails and our, some of our speakers have referenced, is the way to protect families who have an unusual amount of risk. So I'm in favor. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Thank you. I too have a kindergartner, and I would not be comfortable uh, asking him to go back on the 19th. There are a couple of reasons for that. One, of course, as I've said, and no one has addressed, the numbers we're going by are from a period of time when we had less testing than normal. There are about 275 tests per day in Butte County. That's including repeated testing of essential workers who get tested over and over. That's nothing. We simply don't know the actual extent of this virus in our communities. And I'm a little frustrated that no one is taking into account that we don't have accurate testing right now. I do not want to be on this board when we let kids back in and someone gets sick and someone gets seriously injured. I understand it's never gonna be 100%, but I'm asking you, please, 
for two more weeks to make sure, now that all of our testing is back again, that we actually are as safe as we think we are. Otherwise, we are buying into a fantasy because we want to get in before it becomes dangerous again, which is terrible logic. To say we're in now and then it goes to purple again, but it's okay, our kids can be in danger now because it was safe two weeks ago. That is not a position I want to put myself in or any of you. As to the third option, which I think is a wonderful idea, we don't know exactly what it will look like yet. You cannot just say, I'm gonna stick a camera and a big TV in the classroom and it's gonna work. This is my job. I teach kids on Zoom every day. I cannot do that job and also manage behavior of 20 kids in the classroom at the same time. I cannot manage the spacing of students and physical distancing, which we have to do now, as well as everyday classroom behaviors, and also look at a chat and deal with the kid who has a connectivity issue, and deal with the kid who's saying something inappropriate on social messenger that I have to watch on GoGuardian at the same time. You are asking teachers to do two jobs, and that is not fair. And the people who do it in the Bay Area and other districts, the teachers are burning out. You are asking your teachers to do too much if you ask them to do this without much better planning and much better prep. Teachers will leave. We can't hire teachers in the middle of the year, we will have to. And I wonder, if we shouldn't take some more time only because when you take this to the union tomorrow saying, hey, do twice as much work, how many of them will push back? We need to know that before we move forward with this. Having two days of prep time to do a whole new pedagogy is not realistic. We did two days over the summer. We still had teachers who were coming in completely unprepared for the little things that go wrong every time you make a switch. We needed more than two days this summer. We need more than two days now. I feel very, very strongly for the parents who children are having a hard time and are having a hard time with kids at home. I live that too, my wife lives that, and it's not fun. But if we're gonna do this, we need to be smart and we need to have a really solid plan. Right now we don't, we have ideas, and they're good starts. We need to, I mean, the words we were using on these slides are what? Communicate, register, plan, fine tune, professional development. In two weeks? A week and a half? Just slow down, use the cohorts and the options we already have to reach out to our most needy students and make sure that when we do bring kids back, they're safe. Please. Okay, uh, Linda, would you like to share, please? Sure. Sure. Thank you, Tom. I really feel your passion on that one. There is no easy solution to this problem that's go going to meet everyone's needs. That's a fact. Um, you know, COVID does pose some real risks for our families and for our staff. There's a lot of stress involved with that. But I do think our district has worked hard to put safety measures in place to help mitigate those risks. I really believe the social and emotional health of the children that can come back to school is important. Um, you know, our hex health experts are deeming it okay to do this. And, you know, we always talk about believing in science and listening to the science. And, uh, you know, I, I feel really strongly that we need to get our kids back in school. Um, I do, as I think Dr. Kaiser mentioned, really want to direct district to work on that third option. I think that's important. And uh, I would like to see that happen before the 19th of October. I don't know, you know, if that will, but uh, let's shoot for that. And the other thing I would just like to say is I do really think the AB model for secondary is the better way to go. I think at this point in time, we can't do that unless we decide to phase in secondary later. But uh, I, re again, would like to see staff work on that with teachers and perhaps put that model in place in the spring. And so with that, I would like to support getting our children back in school. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so... I'm just trying to struggle with if there's any way to split the baby here because um, it is a very 
tough decision when you have people who have such strong feelings, you know, and, and uh, you know, I was just writing today all the different viewpoints I was hearing from people in the emails, you know, their concerns about different things, and it's, it's just uh, impossible. It's mission impossible. What we're doing right now is trying to really please everyone because there's no way we can do that. Um, I agree with Linda that um, we definitely should consider for future the um, uh, alternate day AB option because there are a lot of really strong, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it has a lot of advantages, but it hasn't been vetted yet. And, and we really need, we cannot, we cannot do that right now, even though um, it does sound very promising. Um, as far as the um, secondary schools, um, I'm more perplexed about them and concerned because uh, their students are the ones who I think would be more likely to spread COVID and to contract COVID because of their behaviors and their belief that they're invincible. Um, so I would like to know if, um, with secondary, if we were to do this third option, will teachers, classroom teachers, actually be able to teach, or will they just be standing there with, you know, ingenuity and overseeing the ingenuity? Will we have that ability to have them actually be teaching, as um, Duke, who last spoke, um, was asking us about? Yes, I, I firmly believe that teachers will be able to uh, provide direct instruction to in-person students and also via Zoom. Mr. Lando does bring up the point of contention that it is, um, it is difficult to maintain engagement with students in chat um, and students who are raising their hand via the, the blue button. And so that's something that will have to be considered. But uh, the, we have had teachers uh, from different schools, not all in one school, encourage this, mainly because of what Mr. Marchant said earlier, that some students will not be provided the access to classes they're currently taking without it. And that's the focus is on those, on kids. Mm. So the, the students who need to have or want to have, and this was explained by a couple of people, say they're AP classes. They, they can't do that at Oak Bridge. They, they aren't able to get that at Oak Bridge. That's my understanding. When we shift back, if we shift back to an in-person model, uh, no, those classes will be, there will not, we won't continue this, the um, AP classes or some of the CT offerings at Oak Bridge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being able to provide those, I know those are very, very important, you know, to a lot of students too, to, to be able to, to have those, but more importantly, to just actually be able to have these teachers who are so talented be able to teach instead of them receiving this information, this instruction ideas over a computer. So um, I really wish there was another way uh, that there was, um, you know, ha having the ability to even have smaller cohorts um, developed instead of putting everybody back at once. Um, people have mentioned phasing in things, phasing in the high school versus, you know, starting out with elementary going back and then phasing in the high school after we've had more of an opportunity. But then again, you know, as Eileen said, we've been preparing for all of this and we have those things in place. So, um, you know, as much as I feel that, you know, we have to respect those people who do not feel comfortable with sending their kids back, if we can get the teachers to buy into that, um, Knowing that, like what you said, Tom, I, I know, I've been there too, and I, I know how difficult it is to try to engage students and, and control all the other stuff that's going on in a room, and it's, it's definitely not easy. 
I know in a lot of schools, I know in my son, uh, my grandson's uh, classroom, there's an aide, and there are no n numbers of aides that are there to help out in a lot of the classrooms in the, you know, Title I schools. So that's a big advantage. So you got a couple people, but to better help that, is there any way we can provide more people to, to do that? Or, we, you know, is, is that a possibility, Ted? I, d I don't know. So I think one of the topics we've been talking about is if we had, if we come to an AMPM model and start with that, putting additional aid time, you know, if, if the A group gets two hours of aid time, the B group would get B aid time also. That's one of the things we're talking about. And I, and I wonder if, uh, if well, in, in high school it would be really hard, um, and I wonder if parents would rise to the occasion too, especially these parents who are clamoring to get back into school, um, would some of them be willing to serve as, uh, you know, assistants or aides in the classroom? One, one option to, there is a concern that by adding more adults into a room, you know, you have more ah. people in the room. Mm -hmm. but. There is an option for students to be designated to monitor chat and to monitor hands being raised. And so someone in person could say, you know, Mr. Shepard, uh, Mr. S or my, my buddy Ted is raising his hand. So there's some, mm -hmm. there's some creative ways to handle it. But undeniably, um, it, there's, there are, there's multiple factors now that may not have been in place before. But there are some other options. And, and do we have information about how some other, you know, somebody mentioned Bay Area schools. Do we have any information about how how these are being handled? These these type of situations that we're considering as option are, as the new option. The information I've delivered to you tonight is as much as I know. I'm getting information from principals who are who are brainstorming because they're receiving all the same emails we're receiving, and and they're in the same corner with these AP type classes. So they're trying to figure out what other just what their friends are doing. Mm -hmm. um, but the information that I've um, expressed tonight is as much as I know so far, but that, you know, the conversation has just started. It's not even a week old mm -hmm. about the third option. Yeah. Can, can I uh, just say a couple sure. things? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I just want to remind the board that to um, have teachers do both things, as Tom was saying, is, um, is going to be a matter of negotiation. So if you have them Zooming while they're teaching, um, that is a, a change in working conditions, and I'm not even sure without agreement we can require teachers to, um, to Zoom in a classroom while they're teaching. Um, however, there are other ways to implement this. Um, with just the data we have here, about 15% of the, the folks choosing um, the other option, they're really not excited about Oakdale, but they want to remain online, and we're hearing from a number of folks that they still want to remain as part of their school. The master schedule can be built in a way where certain periods of classes are offered entirely online. So a teacher may be assigned an online class of, mm -hmm. you know, um, I am one math while they're teaching I am one math in person in the other periods. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to build the schedule that um, we can assign that. That's, mm -hmm. that's part of your assignment. Um, it's just the instruction is, is a different way. So even if we can't come to some agreement, on um, the requirement to Zoom in a classroom, we can build a schedule in a way um, with enough kids that are opting out, and it sounds like we have enough um, mm -hmm. to do that. It's more complicated and takes a little more time, but, but it's, certain, it's certainly something we can do and address the, the desires of the, the families that just can't. Um, yeah, and I think, I think somebody else mentioned, uh, and I'm, I'm going to get Eileen, I'm going to get you, Kathy. Somebody else mentioned that, you know, you know okay, you don't, you don't want to just stick a camera in there and you don't want to do that, but if you tell people that this is, this is really, at this point, what we can do, and they, they go into it knowing that, then, you know, your, otherwise your option is, is, is um, Oak Bridge, then, you know, I think full, full dis disclosure would be appropriate. They may or may not have the teacher they had, um, but um, but the the class will be offered, and it's essentially the same curriculum. It's just delivered online, mm -hmm. delivered via, via Zoom or something. Okay, I'm going to go to Eileen, then then I'm going to go to Kathy. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, two things. You well, we've all talked about phasing in, and um, I think that that if we're looking at, well, not think that, we've asked to look at the A-B schedule for later, that could be, if that could be worked out to begin in um, the spring, that in fact is phasing in. It's making a significant change from what we're 
we have in front of us to approve tonight. I also um, want to point out that the technology that this district has been able to build up over the last five years with the construction of new schools, new science wings, new everything, is putting us in an amazing position with capacity to do some really good things with technology that many other districts do not have. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 you know, I, I, again, I feel very comfortable that that the decision has kind of risen to the top, <laughs> like turning over the eight ball and waiting for the answer <laughs> to appear. Okay, Kathy? So uh, there is no perfect solution, but I want to compliment all of our administrators and staff that have worked so, so yes. hard, literally now for months, to come up with the best possible protection and the best possible legally, I mean, there's a legal component to this that we can't ignore. Prop, uh, Senate Bill 98 is not saying you might, it's saying you must. And so I think that um, we should move forward with opening on the 19th and the AM PM schedule. At the same time, strongly encouraging the hard work that's already been done, that you guys can firm out, develop, flesh out the third option. So those parents really, I feel really strongly, if you have a kid that's high risk, no, you know, uh, or if you have a family member that's high risk, so that we can let them have the emotional social support. That's what they're all going back to. I, I, my kid loves my teacher. They, they see these classmates. They want to be there. They don't want to be shuffled off. Well, we're not trying to shuffle them off. And I, I do believe with a, a time framework, with negotiations, with all the safety stuff that we are having delivered, that come the 19th, there will be a third functional option. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, we have uh, so much concern. We, we had an SORO officer who wrote about the real fear and concerns that they are seeing about the kids that aren't being touched by the safety of school every day, and it's very, very real. So uh, for me, that's the driving thing. The safest place for kids, the vast majority of kids, is actually in school. Okay. Yep. Yes. Oh, wrong way. I'd like to make a motion that we um, adopt the safety guidelines um, to be modified to drop the um, thermometer checks at the entrance to schools. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by Eileen Robinson, a second by Dr. Kaiser. And this had to do with um, what uh, Mr. Boltima the safety guidelines. Yes, uh, said about not doing the on-site yeah, for that. every child coming in uh, the temperature checks. So um, we'll do a roll call vote. Um, I, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Linda. Aye. Tom. And do I. Okay, Kathy. Guys are I. Griffin, I. Robinson, I. Okay, that passes. Thank you. Um, I have yes. another motion, Madam President. Sure, go ahead. I move that the Chico Unified School District um, start uh, in person classes on October 19th using the AM PM model in both elementary and secondary with the intent that the third option that we've referred to um, will be um, ready for implementation um, by that same date. Second. Okay, we have, yes, Tom? What if it's not? Uh, 
I don't think we can come up with a what if not. I'm going to depend on Kevin and Jim and Jay and John <laughs> to to work it out. I, I think that uh, CUTA is as committed to making this work with everybody's needs being met as closely as possible. I have faith. So just to be clear, we're moving to approve a plan that we don't know the details of. Yes. That does not seem like a wise course of action. Okay, uh, we may need to be more specific um, about about that. Um, yes, Jim, do you want to do you want to explain how that might be, how that might work? Um, because I know you cannot commit to something that hasn't been achieved yet. You can't say for sure. And so I guess if we, Correct. if we. It's gonna to have to be negotiated and then, uh, and then voted on, or the fallback position is the current contract, mm -hmm. um, which, um, you know, is a, is a working a full day. Now, whether or not it's traded off day to day, um, I mean, we, that might be the fallback position. Well, the fallback position, meaning like right at how it exists right they now? Work their, no, they were the, still in uncharted territory. Yeah. But the way I see it is um, they would work a full day, a normal day. We could we can switch kids in and out, and it's just a, it's truly an A-B the other way. That's the fallback position because we're not changing the work conditions. All we're changing is the number of kids in the class, and um, and uh, they're 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 teaching in their regular schedule uh, without any any changes that that would have to be the fallback so oh. if i get clarify this yeah if i'm correct so uh, if we uh, vote to pass the modified traditional amp and model and it fails negotiations we would be in the we're gonna have to fall back to the contract that we have and i, I don't right. kevin right, be, i don't know if kevin would that be still a, on B, it. A, the a b model um kevin are you still here or did I, you go away <laughs> i think that is that would be the only option yeah, the because a, the only thing we're changing is the number of kids in right. the classroom on right. any given day the schedule is all the same the right. start and end time is all the same yeah. Um, the periods are all the same. Everything's the same. Yeah. So I think that's. So I think there's motivation the on, the, on the part of CUTA to to not go into that model. It's not it's not the optimal model, and especially when we worked on moving the A and PM forward together, right. and they have a lot of buy-in from a lot of their staff. Okay. okay. So I I'm not sure, um, Erica. Can you read back what Eileen? Um, said in her motion. Do you have that? Board member Robinson moved to the amendment to the speaker in person passage on October 19th using the AMPM model and that the elementary and secondary with intent of the third option will be raised for implementation by that same date as we set forth in high school joint session. Okay, well, that's with the intent. You, you said with the intent. With the intent, with the expectation. Um, yeah. Kelly, did you want to share something, or, I, or uh, Linda? Um, I like the, the word expectation. Expectation, okay. Mm -hmm. So rather than the word intent, with the expectation that the um, we will have a third option, which would be uh, that the students who are currently in the class could, if they did not feel comfortable attending in the classroom, they would be able to uh, attend virtually. Uh, attend virtually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll accept that. At, would no, you accept that modification? The second at their school agrees. site, right? Yeah. At, yeah. Right. Would you I'll accept, accept that, that if Kathy yeah. agrees? Okay. okay. So that's that's the modification, and um, all right. So um, and and then there's a th there, well. Okay, I'll wait because there's a third motion yes. I want to make. Okay. So we're, are we ready to vote on this motion? Any further discussion on this motion? We're going to take a um, take a vote. Um, okay, all those in favor of the motion Eileen just posed, please say aye. 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 
use it. All in favor say aye. You need to stand okay. Nay. Any opposed? <laughs> okay, so we have one opposed, uh, which is Mr. Lando, and uh, the other four board members uh, approved this. So the expectation is that we are going to um, take to negotiations with the union the idea of a third option and hope that that will um, help those people who are finding it difficult to have their child attend in person. But that will provide them the same as far as at least contact with fellow students and the opportunity to be in contact with the teacher um, at least virtually. Okay, so then I want to make another motion. Um, believe it or not, the president can do that. It is written in the rules. Um, <laughs> that uh, we examine, we direct staff to examine and discuss with the union the uh, pros and cons, the uh, ins and outs of the AB schedule for yes. secondary schools with the um, intention also, the expectation that they could develop a schedule which would enable teachers to have a um, meeting time or an advisory period for collaboration. And um, that would be one day a week. Um, as mentioned by um, Mr. Kessler, I think that was a really good idea. So I would like to see that explored. And I'd like to second your motion. Okay, thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. So here we go again. So we will have to take a vote. Um, anybody else want to discuss this further since we've already kind of discussed it? Um, we'll take a roll call vote. Linda? Hovey, uh, aye. Yes, yes, I'm uh, sorry, Eileen. I have a question. Sure. Uh, as part of your motion, would you imply too that uh, meeting the um, SB 98 criteria? Yeah, we would have to we would have to abide by law. Oh, okay. And um, okay. I know that that that's exactly. Thank you for bringing that up, though, because we would want to yeah. make sure yeah. that it did comply with that. But I also think maybe we need to put a, a time frame on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, for potentially maybe starting at the first of the year, spring, mm -hmm. spring semester, okay, yeah. spring when we semester. get back from break. So we would want to have this information um, through the process so we can vote on it by then. Yes, is that, do you think that's feasible, Jim? Okay, because I know there's, yes, yeah. January 21. Yeah, that gives us a few more months and to think, to plan, to get it all out. It sounds like there's, a, you know, we've already got a lot of information, but there are the details, the devil's in the details. Okay, so we'll take a uh, roll call vote. Um, Javi? Aye. Lando? I think taking time to plan is a very good idea. Aye. <laughs> Kaiser. Kaiser, aye. Griffin, aye. <laughs> I got that, Tom. Robinson, aye. Okay, great. All right. So I think those are the two things we absolutely had to uh, vote on. We actually do have a couple more things on our agenda. So. Kristen Griffin, before you move yes. on. Yes. Yes. I, there's an elephant in the room that I think we need to discuss as well. Okay. Uh, and it has to do with what if we start school in on October 19th and on October 21st, we uh, our county moves back into the purple tier. What do we want to do with well, that? Well, the way we have things right now, is that we would go according to the um, state, Correct. the, what do they, they call that? What do the we call? Stage, the stage, the stage. If we're in the stage, then we go back to uh, right. uh, distance learning. However, we would have the option at that time to con convene again as a board and decide whether we want to change that. Mm -hmm. Going into it, the ex because we already voted on it, that's the status quo right now, but we can decide, because there's other factors to consider. They, they have now given you the option. Once you're in there, you then have the control. You can have the option of saying whether you are gonna go back to distance learning or not. 
So right. if we wanted to have the option of saying, we want to review all of the medical statistics, hey, we're, we're you know, we, we want to know exactly what is going on in the county. You know, what we, we, we saw before with the big upsurge, we saw college students causing the problem. We saw, we saw um, elder care homes, you know, creating a lot of the COVID cases. The jail, yeah, exactly. So we would want to at least have the ability to know before we just shut down schools again, um, is this something that's really going to affect us or, you know, what is the reality of these cases versus just speculation or, or whatever? So we can take a vote on that. It's not a, right now, we can't delve into that. That's going to be a whole other uh, thing to delve into. Um, and it may not happen, but um, that is what the plan is, that we will come back to us to decide what we want to do. Because when we made that decision originally, we didn't have the option. We didn't know we had right. an option. So now right. that we do have an option, we can go back and we can say, you know, so. But we're not going to tackle that tonight because it's just too much yep. to tackle. It's not on the agenda, but right. yes. Okay. Yeah. Why but that's bring it up because I think it needs to stay in the forefront. Right. Of our and mind. that's, yeah, that's a good thing to bring up. Thank you for bringing that up. That's right. It, I, you know. Good. Yeah. Okay. So um, we are going to move on. Yes. Tom? Oh. Eileen, what? No, no. We're moving on. I'm moving on. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to business services tree removal in Cohasset. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we, Yours um, isn't quite as exciting. I'm sorry no, to tell you. No, exciting. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak for this too. Do you? <laughs> okay. But we did receive a phone call from uh, Butte County Fire Safe Council. Um, and we are landowners up in Cohasset, and they've received a grant to do tree removal and provide uh, a safe barrier for the community. And so we're being requested to allow them to come onto our property and remove trees. Um, I, we do have Jim Houtman, who's been online, very patient, and uh, I don't know if he is still on. Oh, um, we should have pushed this up on the calendar, I on apologize, the agenda. But, um, at the same time, uh, if Jim wanted to add anything briefly, um, I'd like to at least make it available to him to at least address the board um, about this issue. So Jim, thanks for your time, we appreciate it. Oh my. <laughs> Is Jim here? Jim, are you there? I wouldn't be surprised if Jim wasn't there anymore. Jim, yes, are you? I'm here. Oh, you are there. <laughs> okay, thank you for hanging in there. Had we known you were hanging in there I didn't I had no idea I am so sorry we would have pushed you up to the front of the well, agenda I, I confess I kind of set my computer aside and was watching the evening news so okay okay good for you all right what was the question <laughs> so Jim I just I, I just want to give you an opportunity to address the board on this you contacted us regarding this grant and included in this as a permission slip from the district to uh allow uh, Butte County Fire Safe Council to remove trees on our Cohasset property. So I just want to give you a, a moment to address the board uh, if you had any clarifying sure. questions. Thank comments. you very much and I appreciate the time you guys are taking to let me talk to you. Um, the Butte County Fire Safe Council got a grant from Cal Fire to do thinning. Uh, we have about seven of them in Butte County. One of them was in Berry Creek and I spent 18 months doing um, CEQA documents that's an env environmental impact review um, to get the project going and then uh, we went out to bid for the project September 4th mm. wow. and then there's nothing left there. So that kind of prompted us to make sure that we did our due diligence to make sure that the first thing that we did was reach out to all the, the, um, the green parts of the county that hadn't burned yet and make sure that we could do everything we could to make sure that those mm. communities were safe. Um, Cal Fire and the Butte County Sheriff's Office has de determined in their evacuation plan the Cohasset School is um, one of the evacuation zones. So that was the first thing we did is went up there and inspected the area and kind of made some recommendations. So what we'd like to do is do some thinning on the school property itself, um, ties it into the Cohasset Community Association property. There's another property south of there that is a private landowner. We're gonna be doing work on his, he has a little over six acres. And then that ties into the Cal Fire Station that's up there as well. So in all, what we're trying to do is create about a 25 acre safety zone area 
uh, that will hopefully reduce the um, fire when it comes through there so that it gives people a place to go and um, um, provide them some shelter if they can't get down Cohasset Road since Cohasset Road is their only exit way out of the area. All of it's free to the um, to you guys. It's part of our grant uh, to do that. And um, we have uh, licensed contractors and foresters and licensed timber operators doing all the work and they all carry all the insurances I think you guys would, rec would need. Yes, Kathy. So Jim, I was giving Kevin a lot of credit for this, but now I realize it's all you, <laughs> you and the fire. So I think it's a phenomenal idea. It's a half a million dollars and the whole community will be so much safer. So thank you. And with that, I move business, uh, the Cohasset tree removal. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that, sure. Okay, a motion by Dr. Kaiser, a second by Mr. Lando. Any further discussion? I have a question. Oh, for I'm Mr. sorry. Kelly. Yeah, go ahead, um, and then I'm gonna go to Kelly. Go ahead, Linda. So, <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You froze. Uh-oh. She's frozen. Yeah. She's frozen. Yeah, okay. Kelly, Kelly, are you okay? Can you talk? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Linda, you froze. Wait a sec. Uh, Linda, are you unfrozen now? I think I am unfrozen. Okay. Yeah, you're unfrozen. Let's go to Linda, then you, Kelly. Sorry. Unstable internet. So, uh, Mr. Helpman, my question was, um, can you give me a sense of the scope of the job at Cohasset School? Will you be cutting down heritage trees? Will you be clear cutting? Or are you just thinning? No, no. So what we are, um, for all of our projects, what we look for is about a 20 uh, foot tree spacing, leaving about 70% um, of the canopy. And what we've done at the school has looked at trees that are either too close together or dying already because they're growing okay. into their canopy. And we just wanna re kind of reduce the fuel loading there. Um, there's also some dry vegetation on the ground that we would be weeding and take care of. The trees would be falled, uh, the brush would be chipped, and then anything of any um, size like firewood type things would be left for the community to take. And that's what we're doing with all of our projects up there. Excellent, thank you so much, thank you. Huh? Kelly? I just wanted some clarification on how we have communicated with the Cohasset community. Um, as some of you are aware, we had trees removed previously, and I think there was a, a communication problem at that time, and I just want to make sure we are not there again. Uh, Kelly, I think there's two responses to that. One is that this is a larger scope um, amount of work versus what occurred um, 10 years ago or so, or it was just on our school campus. Um, and the second is I did reach out to uh, Supervisor Tammy Ritter, um, and she was already aware of this, and, and they had talked, she had talked about communication that had already been made up in the Cohasset community. And with all of the fires, perceptions have probably changed too, but um, it was actually 20 years ago when we did remove trees from the Cohasset campus, and uh, it was not a popular move at that point. And so we're working with the local fire safe council up there as well, and also the community association. Um, and we are we have been out in the community in the last couple of weeks, um, getting people signed up for the rest of our fuel reduction reduction project that we're doing up there. So we're doing mostly all of Cohasta Road and then Vilas Road as well. And we're trying to get as many people as we can signed up to do the project to do uh, both defensible space around their homes and also evacuation route thinning. Okay, um, great. So let's take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, so that passes. Um, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you Appreciate it, have a great uh, night. Okay, and then next is Measure E Safety and Security Funding Update, PV High School Fencing. Uh, yes, uh, Measure E, a uh, portion of those Measure E dollars were earmarked for safety and security, and we provided you a list of all the work that has been accomplished, and we have exhausted those funds. And so at this point in time, we still are in process at um, Pleasant Valley High School, uh, providing a perimeter fence around this space. And we'd like to finish that project, keep it out of the um, budget, uh, out of Measure K. And so we're requesting that the board approve us to finish that project for an amount of $198,967 to be paid out of Fund 42. 
which is the pass-through redevelopment dollars, which we talked about previously, of which you passed a resolution allowing us to spend those dollars in any area that benefits the school district. I move uh, the uh, Measure E safety and security funding update in Pleasant Valley Fencing. I think it's critical that we secure that site. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion by Kathy Kaiser, second by Eileen Robinson. Any further discussion needed? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes. Okay, that's it. I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody, for all of your participation. And, uh, uh, and President Griffin, um, I believe we could stay in this.